The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, welcoming you to the 14th out of 16 collections of entries from website subscribers to the 2021 Orchestration Challenge. This is another terrific batch of entries, and once again, so many different approaches and so many different things for me to talk about. Starting with Scott's entry here, I... <laughs> really loved uh, the, the beautiful shifting colors all the way through. Now, there are some, there are some issues here with balance, okay? So we'll have to discuss them. But let's start off with the harp. <clears throat> now, Scott, if you've been watching some of these uh, evaluations already, you'll know that I go on quite a bit about the harp and so on. But I'm here to tell you that your harp part here is sort of audible, right? I mean, one of the problems is that you have all this pizzicato happening here at the same time as the harp. Now, some of the harp pitches are above what's going on in the pizzicato for the strings. But just in general, pizzicato tends to swallow the sound of the harp, right? Because you have... Yeah, 60 or 70 players all plucking away, and then you have one harpist plucking single strings. So who do you think is going to win in that equation? It's always the string section. And of course, on top of that, you have your, um, your winds sort of blasting away up here. So it all serves to cover the harp sound. So there's some ways out of this. You could bring... Okay, and here's something that I noticed. Okay, and that is, you have the harp way down in the mix. I mean, wh why? I mean, maybe that was something that you did because you wanted to hear, like you were sort of um, checking out your your um, your mock-up and just kind of sort of, and then you sort of had to bring the harp down for some reason. I don't understand why, but, you know, insult to injury, <laughs> right? The poor harpist can't be heard at all. Right, so you just, you know, you got to watch out for those kinds of things. So I think that if you were to crank this back up again to just a normal level, right, then you'd be able to hear your harp. And for some reason, the English horn is is thrown way down here. So what is that telling you? Okay, we'll talk about what that's telling you in a second. All right, but restored to its normal level and, and in fact, marked fortissimo, and given a role, and maybe even <clears throat> like a role mark, and even maybe a big, big chord, right? Bigger than you have got scored here. Maybe a, a big hand over hand kind of chord, right? Where, you, where you're starting lower and you're rolling all the way across the top with a harp. Then, you know, and accenting the chords. Then the, your harp part will sort of be audible against all of this, right? Now here, though... <clears throat> the problem is that you have 
forte trumpets on the downbeat plus horns and horns absorb the sound of of harp very very easily when they're played forte or louder and then here um you know same exact deal right so at the same time as as these chords so once again a big big roll marked fortissimo and you have sort of a chance of the harp being heard in there not a huge chance but sort of a chance now here once again you have a sort of a massive uh, pizzicato roll right in here right at the same time that the harp is trying to play and it's the harp is coming in right after this big race to the top which is going to you know be a fairly loud sound <clears throat> but I'd say that like going forwards here so long as you kept the harp fortissimo that I think at least the chords if they were rolled would be audible now right in here you know da 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 this is really more of a piano part isn't it right I mean it's possible to play on harp it's a lot of work to play on harp and the harder the work is that you are asking the harpist to do the more that you have to respect the fact that they need to be heard clearly because forcing a harpist to learn all of this two-handed stuff this you know sort of two-handed contrapuntal stuff <clears throat> is you know you you can it's really unkind to them if they cannot hear themselves right so if you have your solo violin playing away here you have your fairly strong winds you know crescendo to, for, to forte and um you know clarinets starting off in clarino register and then going across the throat tones going to fortissimo here fortissimo english horn right in here so what chance does the harp have against that kind of tone weight you have to ask yourself is there some way that this could be transcribed onto other instruments like maybe xylophone or maybe um, glockenspiel something that could really be heard against these instruments but harp is barely going to cut it if if at all right so we don't want to insult this harpist by you know giving the, the giving them these four bars of hell to to play which are not really harpistic you know what i mean they're they're playable on the harp uh um olivia who does the um does the 15 second harp uh channel she can play anything but that doesn't mean that all harpists can play anything or everything so in this case um <clears throat> i would say just you know either drop the volume severely on everybody else if the harp part is incredibly serious to the way that you're wrapping up this phrase or choose a different combination of instruments and just let the poor harpist be right <laughs> or maybe just let them play the upper part Okay, so that is your lecture on harp. <laughs> so, uh, apologies. Now, I'm noticing that you have got a lot of incomplete ties, right? This is the, this is kind of like a, um, you know, the let vibrate sort of sign. I think that it's pretty, it's mostly unnecessary in concert music for things like, you know, coming after a string, like strings accented staccato, right? Because accented staccato is an articulation and a note shape, right? And and putting the um, the un incomplete tie after it is, you know, I mean, it, it means, it almost means nothing whatsoever, right? Um, if you really intend for this note to sound longer, then you get rid of the staccato, right? and then just mark it as an accented note and then you get that and if you want it to last longer than a than a single beat then you then you score uh, a dotted quarter note right so so yeah so i would say don't let this take over your concert scoring it's an affectation as far as concert scoring is concerned now uh, where do, is it really applicable is definitely in the case of percussion but once again you know, is it necessary if you really want this to last, just score a dotted half note, right? Dotted half note, dotted half note. And then here, tie to a dotted half note. Just, you know, just give it the full length of its sustain. That is fine. Now, where I would put this kind of notation the most would be like if, 
um, <clears throat> if I was coming to the end of a section and I had, say, a um, like a like a big cymbal roll, and then I was ending right on the downbeat, and I just wanted the cymbal roll, or maybe like a tam tam roll, to just sort of last and last and last, then I would put the incomplete tie, right? And I would actually really prefer to have an incomplete tie that was, you know, that was really, you know, not this tiny wimpy little thing. But something like this, you know, just something really butch, right? That's what I would want on my at the end of my tam tam part, all right? I'd want it to be just really heavy duty, so that you could really see, like, you know, that that the that the <clears throat> that the time value was something serious. So yeah, so I I just I think once again, there's a possibility that this is this is an affectation that it really will start, you know, just sort of kind of scream, oh yeah, that's early 21st century, yeah, you know, and now we write everything out the way that we originally did, right? So I, I think that, I think that just write it out, and, you know, this is obviously a dotted half note, write in a dotted half note. This is a, a quarter note tied to a half note or dotted half note, write it out. <clears throat> okay, avoid that. Don't fall into that thing, okay? Okay, so now, um, a couple more things to take care of here. Okay, okay, so the first is, you are just sending your lower strings up into tenor register territory, right? But then you, you don't throw in the tenor clef until right here. All right, shouldn't it go back here? <clears throat> Let's do that. Let's uh, take our tenor clef and just drop it in right there. Just look at how that immediately makes things more readable for the player. The same thing in a couple other places. How about double bass? Double basses should be able to read, you know, any pro double bassist should be able to read tenor clef. Then you can just get rid of this, <clears throat> you know, get rid of that treble clef, and it's all very readable. Then one last little thing. I, I would say the same thing could be done for all of the bassoon part. Oh, it didn't, sorry, it didn't take, because I was still, I had still had a note selected down here. Sorry about that. Right, see, so, very readable, and you can score all the way down to D, right? Um, D3. And, you know, just perfectly fine for the bassoonist to read, but don't score below the staff, don't score below the tenor staff because then you're kind of, you know, it's as much to say this is a baritone range part. And <clears throat> it's a situation where, you know, you might even want to score this part in bass clef for the second bassoonist if you were to extract the part, right? And, you know, just same thing going on. Anyhow, so <clears throat> those are a few little suggestions about notation and dealing with harp and so on and so forth, right? So now... <laughs> Let us get into the nitty-gritty of the scoring and the evaluation criteria. So sorry about like all of these big detours at the beginning of these evaluations, but I think that they're really valuable to people who are, you know, working on their scoring and getting things together and so on. I mean, that's the kind of help that I would have wanted when I was just starting out as a as an orchestrator. <clears throat> so to apply the <clears throat> the criteria here, uh, the first concern, pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano with no pitches below middle C until near the end of the passage. The concern is if that is transcribed directly onto the... Uh, if that's transcribed directly onto the orchestra, it'll sort of make it sound a bit limited. But that's not a huge concern. I mean, yeah, you you know you go down to sort of lower tenor register and you have some some higher notes in the double basses, but but it still is sufficient enough to add some you know add some scope to the parts. So that's fine. No no problems from you know no complaints from me. <clears throat> 
then the uh, next concern is thematic material repeats often, possibly sounding repetitive if orchestrated the same, the exact same way throughout. Now, the way that you orchestrated the first four bars and the way that you orchestrated the same section following are very similar. They're nearly identical, but you do, an, you, you know, you make enough of a difference by having different string scoring and different brass scoring, right? And then, of course, like the bassoons on the bottom. And it's interesting, you sort of drop these sixths in the clarinets uh, the second time through, or the second on the second pair of bars. <clears throat> so, yeah, so it's, it, it's, it's, enough of a change for me. It's This is an example of what I mean when I'm saying progressing the texture, right? So this is a progressed texture. It's essentially the same thing that happened before, but it's, it is changing, it's shifting, it is growing, right? So it's building on itself. Let's take a look at how it's scored, just a, you know, <clears throat> kind of sort of check how everything is working. This is kind of fun right in here. You have this G sharp sixth, which is going to be played on the second and third strings, and then the open E. <laughs> That's kind of fun. It gives you a nice solid E, like almost like a, uh, it, it, it sounds almost like a, um, like a mandolin on the top E. Kind of fun. Yeah, and, and then it's perfectly fine to score these intervals like this. The B octave, the A octave, and a third. Yeah, it's it's kind of fun. Yeah, okay, so, so no problem with the pizzicato scoring right in there. <clears throat> and then you've got, you know, a, what I would say by the standards of a lot of... Um, a lot of the entries, fairly conventional winds right in here, except like, I like just like a touch, you just have a little touch of, of a little tweet from the piccolo and then another little tweet, and then you have a harmonized, yeah, dun, dun, dun. it's really, really fun. And it's, and it's, you know, somewhat held back, right? It, Cause it's sort of like a conversation between the English horn and the flute family, right? That's really, really fun. There's just so many good things in this, in this, um, so, you know, I, I I hope that you'll forgive me for like pulling it to pieces a little bit. You know, it's just I'm interested in the architecture of it sometimes and also just want to help you make this idea work as best as it can, right? Okay, so here you have these little pushes in your horns. They're all real fun. Um, and uh, but let's let's just stay focused on kind of the the mutated carbon copy here, right? So we have the same approach as before in our winds, our upper winds, and then clarinets, like here you're sort of pooping out with your your clarinets and um, bass clarinet going forward because, you know, really the, the, the brass is covering all that territory and you have all this other stuff going on in the strings too. I really love the trill right here, right? Just uh, playing an octave above the English horn, kind of doing the same thing. And then you're bringing in the first violin to double the first flute. And then below we've got this yeah, da, 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 uh, happening in the, in the second violin. So you know what you could do the second time is this. Just grab this and I'll bring over the keypad so you can see what I'm doing. Just do, excuse me. Just do this, right? That's much, much more readable. All right, and then you can do the same thing here. Uh, let's activate that keypad again. Uh, you know, actually, you can do it backwards like this, right? So just, just so, e so much easier to read for everybody. The uh, score reader, the conductor, the player, the copyist, right? It's, it's just uh, much easier on the eyes. But, you know, and you can even throw this in here. Like, you can just give us the first beam group and then do the same thing again, right? And I would actually... 
That's weird. Break the beams um, like this. All right, just just so I mean I think that 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 is the most economical way of scoring that. And um, yeah, and then we've got like this, you know, this stuff happening in here. Um, the once again, kind of like a harmonization by the violas. That's really really fun. And I think that that all works really nicely. About the only problem though is that you have got your trumpets kind of blasting away on the same pitches, right? And you are <clears throat> you are really pushing these trumpets. And it's funny that the mock-up, like if we look at the mixer again, um, you know, the, the the trumpets are are way up in front there, and yet in the mock-up, it's really lying to you. Like sometimes. Uh, sometimes note performer is brilliant, and sometimes it really kind of lies to you. And in this case, it really is kind of lying to you. Like, the the trumpets will be so much louder than you're hearing them in the mock-up. They will be so much in front, right? <clears throat> Especially starting with this high B. That's going to be paint peeling, right? An accented high B. Just and and you know, of course, there's there's the danger of cracking, uh, especially with like say a, a slightly less um, experienced player. So, you know, you'll hear this B and it might go, eh, right? Just the first time as they, there's that kind of their lip, because like they're starting off from nothing, right? There's no chance for them to warm up or anything. You didn't give them any sort of background chords or anything just to get their lips going. And then they suddenly have to, and they don't run up to the B. They're just starting dead on that B way up high there, right? So, um, a real jock player <laughs> will have no problem they they might they might still crack it, but they but they generally have no problem just starting cold on that high B. But you know, but you're you're kind of you're you're sort of cutting out the um, the less experienced players or or the the you know the less professional orchestras. But I still think it's really really fun. It's great scoring. <clears throat> Maybe um, you don't have to take it up to fortissimo. Right? Maybe you could go piano, crescendo to forte, and then just leave it at that. Right? So instead of having this really blast, because it's going to be huge, right? It is going to drown out everything. So uh, my recommendation is start forte, piano, not mezzo piano, piano, crescendo to forte, and then you don't need this. This is redundant. And the same thing again, piano, crescendo to forte. And I think that that will work really well with everything else that's going on, and it won't drown out the strings so much. Um, it, you know, and, and if you really are concerned about that, you could give a little bit of weight to the part, to the uh, viola part, and, you know, maybe even double the, uh, the second violin part with some winds, and that will, will sort of help the wind, sorry, help, help the strings to not get so drowned out by the, uh, by the trumpets right in there. Yeah, and then I just love the, the, what's going on right in there. It's so awesome. Okay. All right, well now <laughs> let's talk about these other parts here. The um, melodic development soaring quite high to the uppermost orchestral register is the first of our criteria. And the other one is accompaniment figures covering a wide range of pitches and wind registers. That's the other one for this section right in here. Okay. <clears throat> so, like, let's talk about something else right in here, and that is pizzicato harmonics, right? So you are asking for a harmonic on the A string, and um, it is not going to sound all that effective in the double basses, and it is going to be kind of muffled compared to what's going on elsewhere, right? So you want this to be a nice, bold, high pizzicato. I would say just stay away from the harmonics. Just finger everything. The, the harmonics are not going to give it any kind of particular sound quality, uh, at, at least in pizzicato, that will be extraordinary or, or all that, you know, all that interesting to the ear against the force of what's going on here in the horns. Not to mention the bassoons, right? So... Like here, where you're bowing, 
the the you know the when you're bowing this that the harmonics have got a chance but like in pizzicato the uh, you know you know if if the pizzicato harmonics have to compete against anything loud then just forget it you know what i mean it it's just like the harp right there's they're they are a delicate thing it's kind of like a slurring pizzicato uh in a in a loud texture it's it, that's another effect that is just buried right because the the slurred note you know just hammering on or lifting off with the finger is such such a subtle sound on a fretless fingerboard okay so um so let's <clears throat> look at how the uh the accompaniment is uh, the, so you, you're basically altering the the parameters of the accompaniment so severely that uh, we don't even need to discuss whether or not they are being um, they are being scored effectively. You're just basically making up your own accompaniment figures in here. So um, they're very they're they're very lovely. Um, the only thing I would question is like, are you maintaining that? beautiful sense of leaping right there's this wonderful sense of and you know just, this is like a dance it's like a flamenco kind of a dance and you know lots of knees and elbows and and all kind of the feet hitting the ground right on the beat right so you know this is more of kind of like a waltz or a minuet kind of a thing it's more stately the way that you've scored this you know the dotted rhythm and then emphasis on the three uh, and slurring into the one, and so on and so forth. It's a very smooth kind of progression, and you do have some action happening here in the pizzicato. Of course, it's being buried on some notes by the um, by the harmonics. But all the same, okay, there is some activity, but it's not that same. You know, you know, they really don't have that sense of kind of leaping. Um, now, you know, here the accompaniment, you know, bum, ba, ba, bum, ba, 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 bum, this, I feel that this is really an effective way of scoring the, um, the accompaniment figure. And I, I like the way that you take it further than the piano part. That's really nice. Okay. Um, and then there's more fun stuff happening right in here. Melodic development soaring quite high. So you're starting off with oboe octaves, right? And then... Now here you're doubling the low F for some strange reason because like this F needs absolutely zero help from the flute, right? That is a strong note. It is rich. It is powerful. I sound, I sound like Gollum. It is tasty. Okay. Um, so you know what needs to be doubled is the high F because your oboe is rushing up to this note and it is going to be somewhat thin. Right, so you need to thicken this note, right, and also like the presence of the flute absorbing itself into the line is much more effective on the high F than it is on the low F, right? That like here, it'll barely be heard if this oboe player, the second oboe player, is nice and excited and just really kind of playing along and maybe being slightly too loud. Forget it for the flute player. There, you know, the blend will be minimal at best like you really won't hear them until they play a little higher so um really that that this higher f is the place to is the place to insinuate the uh the flute and then right in here this lovely harmonization i just think it's terrific okay uh, you know the only thing that i sort of miss is that that you know you First you have this harmonized part, and then you go to octaves, and then you go to, back to harmony, and I'm just saying, oh, I want more harmony in there. But I understand that, like, the trade-off between harmonization and then just unison octaves and then harmonization again, that's fine. Um, what I would say in here is that if you have horns kind of chugging away here and clarinets and so on, nice, nice loud bassoons in the bottom, you know, I mean, the second flute right in there is really in a weak place now admittedly the piccolo is as well but that's it needs to be in that place it'll rise in strength as it gets up to the g and then the a it'll just completely dominate right in here right so there's nothing wrong with the piccolo even though it's playing the same notes that i'm complaining about here this really is more of an oboe line right so if, if you want this lower line to be nice and clear i would say score it for 
score it for oboe and let the um, you know let the the second flute come in on the G or the A. So yeah, dovetail to that part, I would say, just to make this really beautifully clear, because it's just a it's just a matter of like consistency of timbral weight, right? If you are having this kind of mixed chamber sound, you know, with horns below, doing these little intersecting patterns, and you've got the you know you've got your lower winds. And, you know, it's just like, it, it, is, it is like a big wind octet or a, or a big wind serenade, you know, like Mozart or something like that. That's the sort of like the scoring in here. So timbral weight should be consistent throughout all the parts. And I think that starting off the second flute in a weak place here, even though it does get stronger as it rises, I think it just doesn't, you know, it doesn't make any sense if, since you're going to be ending this oboe part. So just have your second oboe part just continue on under and and you know leave out the second flute until you get higher and so just have it trade off maybe on like i said on the g or the a or or not trade off dovetail right trading off would be one part stops then the other part starts on the next note uh, dovetailing would be they the next part starts on the last note of the previous part okay and then how do you deal with the same passage? Like, this is nice. Like you're doing all winds here on the melody and you're doing all strings here on this melody. Now, uh, you know what? No professional string player or violinist needs that, right? Have them read all the way up to the high E for two reasons, okay? One is that in terms of fingering patterns, High ledger lines are associated with specific fingerings and, and so on and so forth, right? The other thing is that uh, a lot of violinists hate Ottava. I would say probably more top professional violinists hate Ottava than love it. Uh, certainly is the thing that is complained about the most when I talk to concert masters, right? So like you'll, you'll go to my... Um, Ottava do's and don'ts page and you'll see that some people you know some flute players are saying well I don't mind Ottava it's fine with me um, but like if you really look and see like what's the level of of flute players and and uh, violinists who are saying yeah just leave it out those tend to be like the stone cold pros right um, and then the other thing too is that like look you are when you just leave the Atava out, you are showing that there are consequences, right? There are consequences to going this high, right? It isn't just like slapping an Atava mark over and says, yeah, yeah, you know, just, I'll just move my hand up there because I'm a pianist, right? Or it's just, you know, it's just those notes are just an octave higher. No big deal. But it is a big deal, right? And you can, you can see that by the, the yellow, or sorry, the red coloring uh, of the notes. Uh, you know, like, like that Sibelius is telling you, hey, you know, don't send a semi-pro or, or student player up this high. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the notes become shorter and shorter on the, you know, the strings, the stopping of the strings is shorter and shorter. The vibrating area, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until finally it's almost kind of squeaky up there, right? Even with good players, it has a kind of a sort of a squeaky quality. So leave out the atava is the message. All right. Now, uh, when we get to this point in the evaluation criteria, there's a little, you know, upper middle register continues on, relentless if no textural contrast to the previous passage. There is textural contrast. And, of course, you do uh, vary the, the depth and the scope of the scoring, right? So um, I really love the trading off right in here. Um, you allow the rhythmic phrasing to go from the second beat to the first, although you slur across here, that's kind of weird. But, you know, um, yeah, and, and you sort of shift around the, you know, you shift this around a bit and there's like that melody sort of hammering on the E's. You know, yeah, ba 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 e e e I'm just kind of like not hearing it at all, but that's okay. That's just like your approach on this, right? You, what you do instead is you sort of, you know, you you push at some notes and you know you throw in more of the um 
more of the harmony than you do of the melodic E, right? That's all fine. You know, you're just interpreting you're interpreting it differently. I would say break uh, break the slur here, right? So this comes in on the downbeat, or not the downbeat, but on the strong beat of the rhythmic phrasing. And then you know, da 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 da, two and three and one, two and three and one, two and three and. One, two and, three and. That's really a way that the you know that everything is working there, right? So like these these pushes on the bassoon and stuff. It's it's nice to sort of break up that rhythm a little bit. But you know, not too much, right? Uh, but anyways, like I was saying, um, I I really like the like the harmonization with those A's, and you know, the same pitches in the clarinets. That's very very cool. And then you're having oboe come in. It's almost like gilding the lily here, though, to have the the clarinets doubling. But it's fine. And then it's more of an additive thing, isn't it? Right. You're going first clarinet doubling the first, and then first clarinet plus oboe doubling the first, and then first clarinet plus oboe and flute. And and here I would say this is about the lower limit of the of usefulness for your second flute. I would give this to the first flute, by the way, not the second flute. This is the lower limit of usefulness in a sort of a triple or quadruple kind of a texture like this. Or a linear texture, and then yep, up, 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 bump, up, bump, 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 really nicely conceived right in here, except for the you know the harp being at such a disadvantage. Yeah, so it's just like it's just a lot for the harpist to learn in in order for them to show up at rehearsal and discover that in fact like nobody's going to hear anything that they're doing. Right, those are the kinds of things that sort of demoralize a harpist. Okay. You know, it's it's sort of like learning a part for a play that's really, really, you know, it's like this pages and pages of dialogue. And then you get to the first rehearsal and you find out that's been cut, right? It's the same kind of feeling. Um, and I, I like the little, the little bursts of energy and everything else. And I, but, you know, I would say if you're going to put a diminuendo at the end here for everybody then do it for the other players in the strings. Yeah, and just really no problem with any of this. It's it's variegated. Uh, maybe, I would say, if you're going to push your clarinets to forte, uh, fortissimo, excuse me, and your English horn is also going to be playing over, you know, down a fifth at fortissimo, then it's really doesn't make any sense to have, to score the... Um, uh, to score the second flute so low, really. I mean, like, it'll be completely buried in the in what's going on around around it. Like, what if the um, what if the first flute doubled what the piccolo was doing? So you know, because right here the piccolo is getting into very weak territory for it, right? So what if the um. What if the first flute jumped up here to double the piccolo part and the second flute took the first flute part and then you found some other instrument that could play this inner line? That would be probably the strongest way of dealing with it. Okay, so very cool score. A really great way to start off this collection of entries. So thanks so much, Scott. So let's take a look at the next entry. Such a fun score, Luke. <laughs> really, really cool. Okay, so um, let's cover a few little bases. Uh, talk a little bit about some some basic things about balance, instrumentation, notation, and then we will jump into the evaluation of the orchestration. Okay, so a few things. You know, one is it's kind of strange the missing bar line between these two groups. Really try to make sure that your um, that your 
that the bar lines are consistent with the um, with the brackets, right? That's that should be uh, at least you know, like and right in here, um, there's no need for the marimba to be crossing two bars, or excuse me, two staves. Like, yeah, I mean, like right here you have two staves, I guess, but I mean. I always wonder whether or not that could have been scored just just kind of lower in second voice and just keeping it on one staff, right? That's kind of what I would do. And considering the fact that this is, um, you know, that, that extra part at the end that you tacked on there is kind of unnecessary to the whole evaluation, I, I would kind of prefer a single staff marimba part here. And, and that would be all the more reason to have one bar line covering all of these parts right in here, bass, drum, marimba, and glockenspiel, right? Some people like to keep the mallet percussion separate, and that's fair enough, right? But they don't have to be. But uh, the main thing that I'm really concerned about is this right in here, right? Um, you know, don't don't let that kind of thing sort of be look like a glaring rookie mistake, right? So, um, you know, I've, you've been involved with these these evaluations for quite a while and, and you know you, you you have a more pro approach to things so just watch out for that okay so and then also right in here like divisi on flutes right so divisi is a specific term that should only be used for uh at least in concert music concert orchestral music should only be used for the violins right because it's saying we're dividing groups of instruments right and in this case the groups of instruments are consist of like 16 14 12 players right and so eight players so that's a lot of players now in band music you might put divisi on like a clarinet part or something like that like where you have eight clarinets 12 clarinets right so that the in this case what it's that's just specifying is that that the um, the part is going to be divided amongst all of the clarinet players, and it's not just two clarinetists playing, right? But that this that is a different kind of a thing. Here, we don't need. To, I mean, it's completely unnecessary. What what about this? You know, like you you're telling us these are two separate voices, right? So there's absolutely zero reason to tell us that you are that there are two separate voices playing with extra text. Okay, so yeah, so no divisi on. On wind parts, so you know, whenever you have the two different voices playing, and you're giving us, you know, you're you're showing us that by having like separate stems, you know, on the same note or or playing intervals or something, it is absolutely obvious that that's what's happening, right? The only thing that we need to know is ah two when you have a single line and no separate voices indicated. So, like for instance, here you don't need the you don't need the 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 second voice stem right in here along with the first voice stem you just need one stem because you told us ah too right so that this can all be in one voice all the way through okay yeah and the same thing here there's there's you know if you're telling us ah too here there's zero need for a separate stem right for two separate stems just one stem right covers the whole thing all right and yeah and this divisi can just go away you, what we do need right here is a rest like so a, a quarter rest so you know beat one beat two after the rest okay um yeah so i'm kind of noticing the the uh, you know sort of a further thing and that is the marimba and glockenspiel uh, sounds for your sound set are very unrealistic um and they're also unrealistic in terms of the mix, right? So the, the mix on the marimba part is quite loud and, and close, right? So the, the instrument sounds like you're, st you're sitting right next to it in the mix. And the orchestra parts sound like they're like 20 feet away. And that's that, you know, what's it's the opposite in an actual concert situation, right? So th that's something I'm kind of noticing about perhaps less organized uh sound sets is like that that sense that mallet instruments are like right next to you and the orchestra is far away or farther away but in cases like this where you have got you know any kind of strong scoring from lower brass 
as as you've got here, plus nice, bright, powerful winds, the marimba part is just going to disappear. And uh, if you're wondering why, Luke, then you, all you have to do is just check out um, my tip on um, xylophone versus marimba uh, harmonic spectrum, right? So, like, just you can just see right there that the xylophone is a is an instrument that has a wave shape that's very much like a clarinet, and that's why it stands out so brightly. Whereas the marimba has a wave shape that is more similar to winds and strings, and that's why it gets absorbed so easily, right? And it's also a softer instrument, let's face it, just in general. So I think you need to rethink a little bit, you know, especially like, you know, forte, sforza, piano, sforzando, piano, crescendo to forte, accents, right? So it's essentially, it's forte, right? Mezzo forte with accents in this register on trombone is essentially forte, right? So, you know, poor little glockenspiel and marimba did not have much chance against that, right? Okay, and you know, and, and also there are some other balance issues, but we'll we'll tackle them as we get to them. All right, so those are the notation issues. <laughs> now let's talk about the orchestration. So, starting off, we have our basket of criteria, and one of them is pitch weight in the upper middle register of the orchestra, sort of limiting if you transcribe it directly. That wasn't a problem. Thematic material repeating often possibly sounding repetitive if orchestrated exactly the same way twice. And once again, you did not do that. I mean, you have some of the same things happening again, but you know, just merely by bringing in the heavy brass here and, and the uh, mallet percussion in a different way and having a more active uh, bassoon part at the beginning, it sounds different enough, right? It's not really exactly you know, totally, um, totally different, but it's different enough. Okay. Now uh, one, okay. I'm remembering something I forgot to mention to you at the beginning. Okay. Talking about, um, notation and instrumentation. Okay. So, so right here, so, you know, you know, what is going on here? A couple problems. Okay. So the first one thing is that this is not supposed to be an F sharp. It's supposed to be F double sharp, right? So, and harmonically the same note as G natural. It's not da 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 da, it's da da da, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is you are doing a grace note in pizzicato with a slur. So so if it if there was no slur, you it would be, you know, it would be two separately fingered notes. It would be ba bum ba bum ba bum ba buck ba buck ba buck. But since you have a grace note, you know what you're telling the player is that they're going to pluck the first note, and then they are going to hammer down on the fingerboard with the next finger up, right? And the thing is, is that you can write accent all day long on the second note, but the um, the projective power of this second note, of the principal note, right, as opposed to the grace note, the projective power of the second note is very weak incredibly weak right compared to the to the first note and and here's one of those places where mock-ups they, they don't know what to do they don't know what that means they don't know what a what hammering on is they don't know what a slurred pizzicato means right they, that is beyond their um th their programming right so um so it's it's totally lying to you by telling you that there's going to be a G sharp on the bottom here. There isn't, right? It's just it's not going to happen. So there there's going to be just a slight. You'll hear the F double sharp if you correct the the um, the tuning here, and then there will be just a slight oomph on the on the. So you hear plum oomph plum oomph, right? At at best. But you know, since everything else is so loud, it'll kind of muffle. So you kind of hear this kind of th sort of thumping, plucking at the bottom, and it really will be much less effective, right? So having your bassoons play those notes is so much is like a zillion times louder and more effective than taking this approach. Okay, so back to the 
Um, back to the just discussing the orchestration in general. Okay, there is. I'm, I mean, I, I like the way that this is all set up. I like the oboes. This is nice. Um, right here, I think that the second flute is completely unnecessary. And I, I, I know that we must have talked about this before in in another entry of yours, Luke. I, I'm pretty sure that we talked about the kind of the weakness of um, of the flutes in their lower register, right? So. Um, I mean, but like, I mean, I see what you're doing here. You are, you are trying to have everything be soft at the at the end of the little motive, just so that like the flutes have a chance here. But then you have the mallet instruments coming in, yeah, bum bum bum, right? Why can't the flutes, you know, why can't you have ah two like this and just just have the flutes stop, and then just have the oboes play this, you know, play this fifth here. It's just so much, much more, um, you know, convincing. All right? There's just zero reason for the flutes to be involved right in here. I would say I don't think they add anything. That they're inaudible. You know, what's the point? Right? It's just much better just to, if you're going to have this be a little solo here, and I would say come in strong, forte. Right? These are like, especially the marimba is a weaker instrument. Forte. Don't need the crescendo. Just come in forte with an accent. You know, ding, 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 ding. Thunk, 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 thunk. Right. And then, uh, then here you have this echo, which is very, very cool, right? So this is another thing that differentiates the beginning from the end, from the the um, the repeat of that part is that you not only you're progressing the texture, you have this wonderful echo effect right in here. Right? I think that that's very, very cool. Okay, and then. Um, do 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 and yeah once again come in strong come in if you're gonna if you want a crescendo here it should be mezzo forte and then crescendo to forte or even fortissimo here right and then i think right in here like your mixture of pizzicato and arco and so on um was this supposed to be pizzicato right anyways no but it, it couldn't be because this is right okay so mixture of the two so I, I think that this leads into this, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. All right. So I think right in here, there's a misperception of what the harmony is here on the second beat of this, you know, of this bar right in here. It's um, like what is going on in the left hand at this point? It is a D fifth, right? Uh, and then what's being played in the right hand is a C fourth. Right, so essentially it is it is a D minor seventh, right? An in, an inversion of a D minor seventh, but you're throwing like you're hitting this G sharp really really hard, right? And and it kind of puzzles me. You're hitting this G sharp really really hard in here, um, and then here you've got. Uh, yeah, so here you've got G sharp and then D sharp and F, right? So it's just kind of strange. Uh, you know, the, the harmony there is a D minor seventh, right? And you even have these Ds and you have an F here, right? So I just don't quite get it um, because like this, this sort of throws the harmony above out of whack, right? It, yeah, this, this kind of, you know, pow at the bottom here. And it, you know, once again, this makes it really hard to hear your mallet percussion just, you know, blasting right in there. You know, this, this kind of barf, you know, and then like, like we can't really hear the first note of the mallet percussion. It's sort of wasted, right? And then this is kind of strange. Yeah, so forte, you got forte in all of these parts. Now you're saying soft on the trombones and the tuba. That's great. But you're saying soft on your melody instruments in the mallet percussion, right? So this doesn't quite make sense to me. I like to think that that I think that the mallet percussion needs to be louder, right? I mean, it's an integral part of what's going on here. Maybe you wanted to sort of insinuate this into the texture and so on, but I mean, you've already introduced them as solo instruments, so yeah, I don't quite get it. But but that's all right. 
I mean, it more or less works, but this is really what concerns me, right? Is this kind of, this G sharp kind of out of the harmony of everything else kind of throwing off the, the solo mallet instruments. Okay, all right, I won't harp on it. So let's, um, let's, let's proceed on to the, um, the concerns of melodic development going quite high, the accompaniment figures covering a wide range. And I feel that you have interpreted them pretty nicely, but I would say it, there's just, I wouldn't send the double basses up to this high B. I mean, it, it is technically possible, but what's wrong with having the double basses just stop here and have these high Bs being played by the cellos instead, right? They here the, Here's that same exact note, right? So just let the cellos play it. And if you really want it to be doubled, have the violas double that note as well, right? Way easier for them to play. Yeah, and just, you know, don't, I would say, don't don't force your double bass players to get too acrobatic right in here. And then right in here, this, you know, ba 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 I like that. I think that that is nicely done. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it's lightly scored enough that, that it's fine, I'd say. You know, you really are trying to stay out of the way of your marimba right in here. But still, the, the, you know, the weight of the bass in here is, is a bit, is a bit much. And so is, you know, the bass drum, right? Just really back off on your bass drum, I'd say. You know, fortissimo with an accent on a bass drum is nearly for excuse me forte with an accent on your bass drum is nearly fortissimo right and when a bass drum note plays fortissimo it can wipe out the whole orchestra right so just really try to back off on this a bit okay um so now let's talk about the treatment of the melody which is very very fun you know dun 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 dun, dun. I, I would say just go ahead and you know start mezzo forte crescendo to forte right and just commit right um yeah and then just you have this little flute coming in doubling and then glockenspiel yeah it's so cool and the, the oboes way down below you, know, you realize how much lower the oboes are from the glockenspiel, right? So the glockenspiel is already two octaves higher than written, right? So it's three octaves above the oboe part. And then right here, like the same thing, we, once again, we have the marimba coming in, like that little touch of flute, and then So it's interesting that like, you let the glockenspiel be the one that goes to unparalleled heights while everybody else is just really kind of going up to not very high notes when they you know they really could be going higher like the this is pretty much wasted right in here the flute like the flute could be going up to going up an octave higher with zero problem right and it wouldn't get buried by the sound of the oboes and the and the violins so pretty much like the flute won't really contribute anything to the texture till about right here. Right. Okay. And it's kind of strange, like there's you know, piano crescendo to what, right? Where, what is this? Is this, is this forte? Is this, what? what is it? Now this note up here is impossible for the glockenspiel. Perhaps it's possible in the mock-up, but it's not like the notes above C don't exist, right? Maybe they would on some glockenspiel, but basically C is the is the highest note of the piano. So this is this is out of range. Maybe there's some way of like glockenspiels can go down to F. So you could have you could score this entire thing down an octave and you would still be higher than everybody else in the entire orchestra. There is a danger of running up to the same E that is going to be playing. What happens in the what happens in the piano part? Everybody rushes up to a high E and then they drop to the next E down, right? Now here this is down an octave or two, right? Just depending on which part. 
uh, and the um, the the rhythmic phrasing here starts on the second beat, right? That's like this is the new phrase. It starts on the second beat and it goes two, three, one, two and three and one, two and three and one, right? So it really is starting on the second beat. So when you rush up to the same E and then continue on, it's like you're going, you know, you da 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 da. So you're changing it into like, you know. But it's not what's going on. You see what I'm saying? There's a really so like the the benefit of running, you know, maybe sending your your flutes and your first violins up to the higher E, you know, starting this entire thing up higher is that then you get a differentiation of pitch in the phrasing, right? And you drop down the octave and get, uh, you know, a nice, the beginning of the next part is absolutely clear that it's starting on the second beat. Now, right in here, the harp is just, is wasted, right? It's, you know, um, you're saying sforzando piano, but then you have mezzo forte parts and you have a forte bassoon part and it's just kind of unclear what the balance is here. But one way or another, this kind of full scoring, the harp has got very little chance right in here. All right. But I mean, I, I mean, in spirit, like, you know, all the other things that are happening here, it's kind of fun, right? You know, you got a, a nice, big, strong unison with your upper winds and violins yeah da 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 dum and and then right in here it's like if you really want this marimba part to come through everybody has to drop to piano or mezzo piano right and then the marimba will go do 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 and um you know and then bring in the glockenspiel da da and the harp right and just once again everybody has to be very soft in the um in the other parts now here is like here is where I I just I don't I once again I don't understand like here you, you know you're starting off your bum 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 and and it's very very low this is this is rather unique um the treatment of the um the the final little passage leading to the next section um I would say like you, you really you know this is all pizzicato so you don't have to worry about staccato you know maintaining a driving staccato is not like not a huge deal right now right in here though you didn't have to mark arco twice but right in here like this is this is sort of similar to the to the final in fact it is like the final bar but sort of coming in a little early and then you know it's it's basically it's this up a couple of octaves and it like this doesn't really fit the um, um, it doesn't really fit the pattern of what's going on in the lower strings. So I would say that you know that this that the first thing is this needs to be stronger right in here. I would double it with say like low bassoons, maybe tuba on the bottom line or something. But it just needs, or if you had a contra bassoon. I think it just needs to be fuller, and I think you need to watch out for throwing in like these little upper lines and so on if they don't agree with the with the unfolding harmony, and if they sort of distract. Like this is really pushing towards this, right? It is absolutely has a purpose in and it is set up really nicely, right? But then here the um, um, this kind of distracts from the all the momentum, right? So you know what is that, right? You know, what 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 purpose is it? accomplishing i would say probably like you right here you start to sort of run out of space right we're you know we're kind of getting to a place where you you really want to be able to end up going down to a right so um what if you started off with cellos and violas in the same relationship and then worked your way down through and then the traded off to basses and cellos, right? And so this would be come in an octave higher, right? And then maybe score this in context or maybe keep it in pizzicato so that it doesn't pull away from the attention of the listener from the main part that's happening right in here. But anyways, that's just my, you know, those are just my feelings about, you know, it's kind of my impulse 
from checking it out and thinking about it and so on just like really wanting this to really lead into like that that's that final criterion which is transitioning smoothly into the next passage i feel that this is a nice smooth transition you know perhaps just fixing the scoring a bit but this quite doesn't quite this this sort of roils the waters right it's it it it, it unsmoothens things i can't I can't see how this is leading into this beautiful emphatic with the you know with the I'm not it's not it it's kind of making things less clear is it's there's nothing wrong with doing it right it's just like what's the overall purpose of the music according to Faya's vision right is is that adding to it or is it subtracting from it. But anyways, I mean, just once again, I mean, you always send in really cool scores and, you know, it, it's so fun to look at and pick apart. And, you know, I always have a great time. I, you know, I know when I get, <laughs> I know when I get a score from you, it's going to be really, really fun. So, and this is no exception. And it just makes me think, wow, what could Luke do with the 2022 uh, piece? that um that I came up with I actually came up with it like right as I was announcing the 2021 I just you know I stumbled across this incredible piece that you know is so different from everything else we've done and and is also you know a little off the beaten track for its own composer right and and but it's just just it is a a beautiful jewel of a piece that fortunately is not significant enough in the body of work of both the, its composer and, you know, and the period in which it was written. Um, it is fortunately insignificant enough that it hasn't been orchestrated yet, uh, or or if it has, the the orchestration has not become a big big thing. So here's our chance, everybody, <laughs> to score something that is is completely new, right? Is completely I think it's sort of like um, with um, uh, that other piece, the um, the seamstress, right, by Mussorgsky. I don't think anybody had attempted an orchestration of that yet, right? So, so it's the same thing, right? We have this chance to break new ground with our orchestration, and wow, Luke, you know what you could do with that? I would really, really like to see. So, thank you so much for this great entry, and now let's go on to the next one. So this is some great work, Samuel. It, it It's really a great example of nicely placed doubling of winds and strings and using things to their best effect. And, you know, I, I, I'll apologize in advance. I know this is going to be a shorter evaluation, and that's just because there is a lot less to pull apart here. Like, there isn't a lot I can do to say, you know, well... You know, could you fix this? Is that wrong? Is, you know, is could this be done a different way? Because the vision of what you are presenting here is is nicely done. It's well crafted. It's like there isn't a whole lot to pick apart, right? About the only thing I would say, like, um, like overall, we'll, this will come out in the evalu evaluation criteria is like, you know, what could have been done to possibly add some color or to, you know, to, to vary things and so on. Right. Um, but you know, just in terms of the workability of everything, this is ready for the stands, right? So if you are completely happy with the way everything is going, you know, if, if that is, if that is the vision that you intend to put out there, there is nothing wrong with it at all. Right. You, you could this could be played by the players, like in terms of like the notation. I'm not seeing anything, you know, I'm not seeing wrong notes or, you know, I'm not seeing anything that like any concerns that I would have to like 
talk over with you in a heavy way. Um, I'm a little worried about the you know missing double bases. What could the double bases have done? Could they have come in here at the end? You know, but like you you are, I think you are wisely limiting yourself to to like a comfort zone, right? That's that's the that's the sense that I get from this, is that you know this is where you are the most comfortable and and you know you know what you're doing and you are doing it well, right? And, and I feel that that is great. And actually, you know, I was just talking in the last evaluation about how I wish Luke will take a look at, you know, how I, I wonder what Luke will do with next year's um, evaluation excerpt. And, you know, in your case, like, this would push you past your comfort zone. You would have to interpret things in a way that, you know, you know, even if you were comfortable, like you're using instruments in a way that you're comfortable using, you would still have to you would still have to get go outside of, you know of of where you are possibly more comfortable because it's just so different right just it's not to say that the music is arcane or it or you know that has any there's anything special about its nature right but it's still that it is something that is um that you know that just in order to orchestrate it, the challenge of orchestrating it effectively is going to be is going you know is going to be pretty extreme, and that that's you know not looking forward to that either. So um, I'll just have one little comment here on the notation, and that is these ties were put in there because the left hand of the pianist was hitting this with their little finger. And then their uh, second finger would be hitting the B nice and hard, and then the little finger would be coming back and hitting the E again, right? So it's bum bum bum. So uh, Faya is underlining the fact that he really wants this to be held, and he didn't want to put in a quarter note because then you wouldn't see the relationship of the tie to the repeated note with the little finger, right? But in if you are just taking that exact line. And you're dropping it into an orchestral part. There's zero reason for you to tie this because the um, the player is is not working out any relationship, you know, to to the repeated E, right? Right. So, boom. See, that is what needs to happen there, right? And then the same thing here, just to show you what that looks like on Sibelius. Just you know, just select the the quarter note. On the keypad. All right. Now, one last thing too is um, something that perhaps could also maybe push you out of your comfort zone. I'm noticing that that score that you submitted to me was scored in uh, concert pitch. Let's see what it looks like transposed. Right. So um, you, you see, there's not a huge difference, is there? But it just like the English horn pitches just really look, you know, you can, you can really see that they are higher up on the instrument than you might think, right? You know, we're starting to get towards the upper register of the instrument. And then as far as the clarinets are concerned, right, it's, it's a little higher than you might expect. And you can sort of see right where the throat tones are much more clearly than otherwise, right? So you can see the starts in the throat tones. Uh, yeah, da, 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 and so on. Which is a cool place. Don't don't you know? There's nothing wrong with it. But don't get me wrong. But it's still you know it still is much clearer. And then bass clarinet, right? That's all much more clear. Okay, so <laughs> um, there is one last little concern here, um, and that is the double accent here, right? So there is a reason why there were two accents on the you know in the template, right? It's because you know what what's going on in the piano part? The pianist is hitting the top two grace notes with their little finger and and their second finger, right? They're playing an E fifth, and then they are hitting the B with their thumb really hard, right? So the it's accent of the top part of the hand and then the thumb 
right? So it's going chakung, 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 chakung. Accent, 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 right? Ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. But that doesn't really translate to a single note being played ah to by clarinets, right? So you know, all you need is the accent on either the principal note or on the grace note. So one way or the other, they're both, you know, it, it's, it sort of means this, it means the same thing whether you put it on the first or the second. But I would say, you know, you just need it on one of those notes. The context of the double accent on grace note and and principal note is just is just because of the pianistic nature of the original right hand part. It has nothing to do with individual lines, right? So watch out for that. And then just you know the very very quick way to return the screen to fill you know to to the right size is command or control zero. All right at least in Sibelius. Okay, so uh, let's, now, let's talk about, um, oh yeah, one last little thing in scoring. I think it's a good thing that you wrote your viola in treble clef. Uh, I think that that, you know, like if you're gonna send it up to this high B, right, if we were to throw in an alto clef here, you know, there's there's nothing that's all that unreadable for an experienced viola player, but just you know, uh, you know, high B is considered to be the upper limit. But I just I would just say that like a lot of this makes more sense uh, in treble clef. So, but one thing you could do is I think you could move this. Um, Oops. Darn it. I think you could move... Arr, see, I'm running out of space on my touchpad. You could move this possibly back to here. Well, you know, no, this is fine. Put it right here. I would say. You know, for me as a viola player, I think that's just the, the most readable, right? Yeah, okay, so anyways, so those were some minor quibbles. So now let's talk about the orchestration. Pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano with no pitches below middle C until near the end of the passage. That is the, the overall scoring of the piano part, right? That's, and so the question is like, what implications does that have for exactly transcribing that onto the orchestra? That means that the orchestra part is going to be very trebly all the way through for quite a few bars, right? So it just kind of goes on and on and on, and it is and it is really in the upper register all the time, right? Then the next concern like that comes out of that is the thematic material repeats often, possibly sounding repetitive if ex if orchestrated exactly the same way twice, right? And and that is something that is also kind of clear from your interpretation here. So these two bars and these two bars are orchestrated exactly the same. And the same you could say the same thing, these two bars and these two bars are orchestrated exactly the same, and they're nearly carbon copies of this right in here. Yeah, so the next... The next um, thing that to think about in in all of that is, would there be some way of progressing the texture? Do you know what I mean? Not not to say now you have to do everything differently, Samuel, because otherwise it just sounds repetitive and boring. That's not the concern. The concern is this: What if your interpretation of this piece became the standard interpretation. What if the concert world caught fire, right? What if just suddenly everybody wanted to hear this piece as orchestrated by you and it was this new work that was played all the time? Now go back to this and say, would you be happy just completely repeating more or less what happened before? Would you want things to sort of expand a little bit, right? 
Is there some way to make it broader, deeper, bring in the lower, uh, the lower winds, or maybe throw in a timpani strike at the beginning of every two bars, or maybe even like a cymbal splash? Like, is there some way that you could be advancing things? You could, you can keep the same general idea of the orchestration, but can you make, you know, can you make it expansive more, right? Like maybe jump the, the, um, the piccolo up maybe add the english horn into the yun dun 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 right and and maybe also like have the second violins doubling that lower um that lower yun dun 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 so there's you know just think about like how can you make things bigger or or make things different going forwards but not you know it doesn't have to be completely like opposite but just it, like i say progressing the texture right like it's a living being that has to grow, right? It can't just do the same thing over and over again. Now, having said that, just looking at the orchestration of it, I think it's all fine. And I think it's fine that you're keeping the piccolo down in the kind of weaker register to begin with because you are moving on from there and you're going to go, you know, you're going to use the piccolo to go up to that high D where the other instruments would be less satisfying. Um, to say, you know, if they can even reach it at all. So, so that's fine for the piccolo, and it gives a nice weight to the other two flutes. And, you know, the composition of the chord here, you got A2 oboes, is going to be a very cutting sound, but that's going to be doubled by the second violins. It's just pretty much straight doubling all the way through, right? The, the, the strings are expressing what's going on in the winds, and it is pretty much exactly as it is. And you're even even just adding this little uh, note right in here, right? Just right there on that beat, that that little A coming in there to kind of supplement and and so on. Yeah, so I mean it it all works pretty much fine. So so like it's just a question of like. When you come back on the repeat, can you do more, right? Is there is there something more you can bring into it? All right, now going on into the next part, like these these sections are somewhat mirrors of each other. They're, they're very similar, right? Um, they have a very similar construction in the piano part. And there are two concerns in the criteria. One is the melodic development soaring quite high to the uppermost orchestral register. How do you manage that? And the other concern is the accompaniment figures covering quite a wide range uh, of wind registers if you're going to transcribe it onto winds. And here you pick the perfect instrument for that in that register, which is clarinets. Right? And then doubled with viola is the perfect partner. Uh, so it makes all the more sense for this to be in treble clef. Right? Then... Um, but let's just talk about that going forwards. Once again, clarinets, uh, you know, ba 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 ba. I think that all that you know. Maybe you could have staccato then accent ba 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 ba. I think might work better. Um, at least just for the English horn, and the same thing with the cellos. So you know, if you were to broaden this in response to this, this could also be broadened in terms of its scope, right? Um, you know, just, but I would say one thing, if you do jump this up the octave, drop it back down. Like don't, don't play, don't score this higher because this needs to be where it is in order to complete the, um, the, the arc. So let's talk about the melody. So we've got piccolo and flute and then of course the piccolo sort of takes over and plays the high d and so on now this high d and c are perfectly possible on first flute but they just they're just kind of they just you know the it just gets kind of smaller and smaller the kind of window of being able to play those and they're just they're not the they're not the greatest note in the world right it, and it's the same thing with like sending the violins all the way up to those really really high notes it is possible for your violins to go all the way up to the same high E as the piccolo and to go all the way to the same high D and C as the piccolo there too. But it's just like the quality of the note is not that great. Now, um, having said that, there's no need for 
the uh, flutes and the and the violins to you know to get stuck doing the same arc as the second violins and the oboes uh, dropping down temporarily on these two notes right in here will certainly give the illusion that the rest of the instruments are continuing to play along over the top of that arc the the um, overtones from the flutes and the and the violins will give that illusion that they're continuing to just go up the same arc right and then they can rejoin on the a so you don't have to continue on this lower line and make it too thick going to the end of the passage and then you just end up in this really you know you end up coming down to the b rather than having to jump up to it again just a little suggestion there now <clears throat> here um you know it really is a a very very thickly scored melody with um, you know octaves. We've got we have the unison for the piccolo and flutes that works really great. You do the same trick here, dropping down, and then the oboes um, playing down here. But it's kind of interesting that like you have like you choose to do unison unison violins here, right? Rather than the second violin supporting the oboes and playing in octaves and then the same thing happening here right so the oboes are a bit neglected down there and the the texture is really really thick on the top line right so it's it's it works but it's unbalanced and the same thing is true here it's like this works but it doesn't really have that kind of balance across the registers and you know if you're going to drop down anyway right but why can't the um why can't the seconds um, double what's going on in the oboes. <clears throat> so the biggest problem that I see here is that everybody drops at the same time and man can you hear it in the mock-up, right? So you know, what do we want here? We want to replicate the notion that Faya has here of an effortless orchestra that can everybody can just scream all the way up to this high E in octaves in both parts, right? That is the illusion that that we need to transport, we need to import into our score, right? However, if you compensate by dropping a seventh in all parts at the same time, then you're giving, you are ripping away the veil, right? You are showing us that man in the corner behind the controls, right? The, you're showing us, you're laying bare the, the calculations, so, um, you know, so the first thing is, which instruments need to drop and which instruments don't? Uh, the first thing I would say is, the clarinets don't, do not need to drop here. There's absolutely no need for at least the first clarinet to drop down again. The first clarinet can run all the way up to a high F sounding, or F sharp sounding E, right? So if you want a lower line to come in as well, then that's perfectly possible in the viola and the clarinet. But there's like once once again there's like no need for the for the um, for the clarinet to drop down. And I would say try to keep the emphasis off of this note if you're coming in with a lower line late, right? So just come in like come in with your lower line earlier, right? So that there's less emphasis on it. Like it doesn't like raise raise the raise an eyebrow from the listener's ear. I know that sounds, that's a very weird mixed metaphor, but. Okay, and of course the oboes can do a straight shot, right? And the, um, uh, the violins could be going even further. They could be going all the way up to, you know, A, even B, right? Before you would want to maybe drop a little bit before they got a little too squeaky, right? Or you could send the violins all the way up to the high E too, because they're going to be doubled by piccolo. So it doesn't matter about them sounding squeaky. So I would say just like figure out ways so that everybody doesn't drop a seventh at the same time, right? So it can happen at different times throughout this line. And some parts don't need to drop. Like for instance, in the case of the second violins, like like you could have the violas doubling a lower line that is coming through on maybe second clarinet, and then the seconds doubling the oboes and the first clarinet, 
and then the firsts doubling the flutes, but the drop happening at, happening at different times. And that way you just erase the drop and you have the, you support Faya's illusion or Faya's, uh, Faya's intention rather with an illusion that is um, ironclad, right? It is like completely, you completely do not hear the drop and, and you take away the kind of, uh, just, it just really feels like you're pulling the rug out from under the under the ear of the of the listener when you do everybody dropping at the same time. Okay, um, and then if you if you have more instruments sort of reaching that higher point, then it doesn't feel so much like you're just going e e e e yeah, dun, 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 because that's not what's happening here, right? As I've mentioned in a few dozen uh, evaluations by now, the phrase ends on the downbeat. And then the new phrase starts on the second beat, and it goes two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one again, right? So you really just want to avoid all the E's landing at the same place, right? So that it really is, you know, we finish this off. Right? So this really needs to have its own start. And, you know, of course, a score, you've got some of those same doublings, and they all work fine, and they're smooth, right? And you know, yeah, da 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 dum, and then I like you the trade off to just uh, like like no more piccolo, and then just like a two flutes, yeah da 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 da, and then oboes, yep up up up, and then this is all cool, yeah da 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 da, da. and it, it all works fine. Okay, so so you know the thing that I would challenge you on here, Samuel, is like, does everything have to beautifully double like this? Are there ways of like bringing out different colors in different groups of instruments without the doubling, right? Usually, I don't bring in doubling this intense unless I am dealing with a really powerful mid-range texture. Uh, like if there's a lot of brass and the brass part is important and you cannot leave it out and they're playing like a massive big chorale in the middle or, or doing some other kind of, you know, just blasting theme or something like that, I might double everything up just as comprehensively as you have got in here. But normally I would avoid it. I might have a little bit of doubling, say, on the top line, maybe flutes and violins, or, you know, I mean, you could just go and take a look at my score and see how I handled it, right? But it doesn't have to have every instrument doubling every other instrument in winds and strings. It's a beautiful sound, but, I mean, it, it after a while, it's just the same trick, right? Over and over again. <clears throat> Uh, another example of when I would do this kind of really extreme doubling would be like in a um, in a crossover score where there's like a rhythm section. You know, there's drum kit and there's a double bass, not double bass, there's an electric bass and like guitars and a guy singing and, you know, um, maybe kind of almost like synth keyboards in there and stuff. I would probably have the violins, like the upper winds and upper strings doubling, doing a lot of doubling just to kind of be able to compete, right? And there might be a real simplicity to the music that would feed into that. So I would say like, this is a really great score. There's like nothing wrong with it, but like, is there some way that you can be more expansive in your scoring, right? And, and avoid so much doubling is their way of bringing out the discrete colors of the orchestra of like maybe throwing things like strings and then winds and strings and then winds or having maybe the wind supported from below by the strings or vice versa right if there are there ways of differentiating the colors and the textures more that would be my challenge to you and i think that that would be a good thing to aim for if you were to enter this challenge again in 2022 especially with like i said you know uh the uh, selection that we're going to be scoring. So thank you so much for this, uh, for this entry and the work you put into it, Samuel. I, I really do appreciate it. And now on to the next evaluation.
Very fun entry, James. Okay, so, uh, you know, what is great about this entry is also what is possibly um, over the top for this entry, right? And that is just huge amounts of timpani and bass drum and xylophone, right? The, the, just the complete domination of this, of this uh, score by those elements. And uh, I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. I mean, it's like a great xylophone concerto, right? Um, but, you know, to, to sort of, to, you know, to kind of like focus on the orchestration part of the orchestration challenge, what we need to think about in terms of xylophone is that it has a tendency to just dominate everything. You know, it is, it's dry, it is plinky, it is loud, uh, it, it basically just takes over any kind of, um, of, of texture or, or melody to which it is introduced, right? So those are the extreme consequences, right? Anytime you add xylophone, it almost doesn't matter how the rest of the piece is scored because the xylophone will just make everything work because it is the xylophone, right? And it is, it's almost like throwing in a piano there, right? So like, let's say that you had, that you had a pianist that wasn't able to play their left hand and they just basically played the right hand throughout, right? It would be the same thing. The, the piano part would just dominate the orchestration and the orchestration would be this little support behind the piano. So that's the same kind of thing happening here. Plus we have, of course, the thumpy, um, you know, the basically, I mean, essentially the trombones, timpani and double basses are all kind of doubling throughout here. There's a, there's a couple of notes difference, but yeah. <clears throat> it's perfectly possible for you to have to, uh, a timpani tuned to A as well. So, so it would have been perfectly acceptable for you to throw in A in there. Um, you could easily get out of just a set of three timpani, you could get the E, the A, and the B. That's, you know, that would be pretty standard. Okay, so... <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to more or less evaluate your entry without thinking so much of the xylophone. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I will include it in the calculations of what's going on, but I'm trying, going to try to uh, sort of talk about the other things. And, and I'm kind of wondering, like, you know, what would, what would it sound like without the xylophone, right? And, you know, would, would it be with the, or maybe just like the xylophone in here. Like, what if you were to take out xylophone everywhere, except for just right in here, right? Then how how would the orchestration work? So let's dive into the criteria, okay? The first one is uh, pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano and so on. That's not the biggest concern. You have got a big, deep, low end here. That's... So that takes care of that, right? So that checks the first box. Second one is thematic material repeats often, possibly sounding repetitive if orchestrated the same exact way twice. Well, you know, if that is a concern, if that is something that you feel that you would object to, then, um, then you did fall into that problem, right? So if that is a problem, then, then this is a problem. But that doesn't have to be a problem. I mean, if you say, well, well, I just wanted to do exactly the same thing again, then fine, right? But it's just a it's just one of those you know boxes to tick. Like, is there any way to progress the texture? Is there any way to move forward with the arrangement? Is there any way for, you know, in an overall sense, for the the um <clears throat> for there to be some kind of unwinding or developing or expanding or, you know, overall change over the first 16 bars as opposed to A, B, A, B, right? Or A, B, 1, A, B, 2. <clears throat> so that is just for you to think about, right? It's not, it's not for you to say, oh my God, I've made a mistake and Thomas is right and I should change everything. I'm not saying that at all. Now, one last little detail here. 
um, in terms of notation, you're not telling me how many of each player, right? So normally in a case like this, like you would tell me which trumpet player this was. Like this was the first trumpet player, you'd write one period. If this were three trumpet players playing at once, you would say ah three. Or if it was two playing at once, you would say ah two. And the same thing goes for the horns, any wind or brass instrument. You would have to spe specify how many of which instrument were playing whenever there was a single voice. Now, obviously, when you have intervals, it is the um, the first and the second player and so on. And, and I like the way that you have... Um, you have the um, the second playing the lower middle voice and the third playing the upper middle voice. So you you are respecting the layout uh, of the one two three four horns, except for right in here, the low note right in here should be the E, right? So you should give, you should give this to the second, and then this should be the fourth horn below. Right, and then if this is the third horn, then that's all good, except the A should be played by the by the first horn and the E should be played by the third horn and so on right and then right in here these two parts could be played by the second horn and this could be played by the first and third right so it's not perfect but like it starts off really good and then right in here if this was intended to be A2 in both horns then I would say you would score both parts together right you'd have F sharp and A G and E F sharp and D and so on in both of these staves with the like so that would be like the first and the second and the third and the fourth playing both of those voices right so that's how you would deal with that but if this is just intended to be the first and the third that's fine but you have to write them in right because I can't I don't know what it is right okay so um, picky 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 I know that's me so let's look at the orchestration of the first part and just kind of nut out um, how I, we could possibly make this, you know, even better, right? Like, you know, like you have this conception of how you want this to be. So how can we maximize that? So the big problem that I'm seeing here is that you have a kind of a dynamic mixing scheme going on here. And usually like dynamic mixing is not all that important, except for when you have like really loud brass it's like a huge loud texture the brass are loud and they're drowning out the winds and the strings so you might bring the brass down in volume so that would be one 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 legitimate use of dynamic mixing another possible instance of dynamic mixing would be to bring up the harp right so if you have a mezzo forte texture in the rest of the orchestra, you might want to write in forte or even fortissimo in the harp part if if its part is really important needs to be heard, right? Okay. However, this kind of dynamic mixing is not needed, right? So like like here you have fortissimo on the flute and piccolo playing octaves together, and you've got forte on the clarinet and the oboe, which actually would be less audible, right? These parts would be less audible than the than the flute and piccolo just because they're lower, right? And then here you have the horns just blasting away on these low Bs, right? An octave above the uh, trombones, sounding B. And, you know, and so like, so, so what is the outcome here? You'll hear, sort of hear the flutes and piccolo on top and you'll sort of, and you'll definitely hear these massive horns in the middle. And you'll hear the bass drum timpani and trombones just because they're all thumping to, away together and double basses. But like, you really won't hear the, the middle winds at all. So how to fix the situation? It's very, very simple. Fortissimo winds and forte brass and, and percussion, right? So that's how to balance this. Just keep them forte. Here I would say... If you really want this, yeah, dun, 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 and you want it balanced, you want the violins to be audible, and um, you want the trumpets not to shout everybody else out, then I would say make sure that this is scored um, with just a single trumpet. I think that that is fine. Or maybe A2 at the most, but not A3. That's too many, right? And make sure that it's at forte. And here you sort of have a space in between. You've got the trumpets here, and you've got the piccolo two octaves above. It looks like an octave, but it's like the transposition is 
transposing, uh, sounding an octave higher, right? So it's two octaves apart, and then you have the xylophone doubling the violin in the middle, right? So it's, I mean, it's very penetrating sound. Uh, yeah, but if we take the xylophone out, uh, then like it, it, it makes less sense. So, I mean, the xylophone being there does make sense right in here, right? But I would say if you didn't have the xylophone, I would want you to double the first violins with the flutes, with a two flutes, right? All right, and then um, and then this is exactly the same thing. So there really isn't a whole lot of need to address that, right? So let's move on to the next four bar section, our B section, <clears throat> and the concern for both this group right in here, this uh, four bar section and this four bar section is uh, melodic development soaring quite high, accompaniment figures covering a wide range of pitches and wind registers. If you're to score it in the wins. Okay, so I would actually I would actually say right in here that you should reverse this, right? It should be the clarinets that leap up to the high written C sounding B or written C sharp, I should say. And it should be the oboes that play the lower B, right? Because it's for them that is a powerful note and the high B is a, is just a little thinner, right? Whereas for the clarinets, it's right in the right smack dab in the middle of the clarina register, and it is a powerful, powerful note, right? So if you really want that to be, a, you know, a nice, strong kind of a thing, then that's great. Uh, one thing that I would sort of say in here, like the the pattern that you've written in with the horns, weakens the kind of leaping texture in here. I mean, it's really, you know, it's nice and strong, and and it's it has this great stompy quality, but it doesn't really like you know the ba 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 da di 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 da di 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 ba 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 right you know where's that that energy we're getting you know we've got this other stuff going on in here right so it it is sort of distracting a little bit from this so I'm not saying it doesn't work but it's just something to think about in terms of the efficacy right and then um, right in here um, you're sort of spreading things out there's the you know the actual pattern is ba 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 you know or or da 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 so it's it's yeah um i would say like the these notes are actually supposed to be lower right the they're they're not supposed to be really really high right so it's so i think that you might need to rethink putting that high a in there right cuz i think it sort of distracts from the from the the arc of the <clears throat> yes, yeah, so, I mean it, it's intended to be lower, right? Rather than yeah, so the lower E and, and then like just when you get up to A, sounding A in the horns, you just really really sound, hear the horns more than you hear the uh, accompaniment figure. All right, so those are my concerns with the accompaniment figure. Now let's talk about the criterion of the melodic development soaring quite high. So um, what I feel about this is that these first bars each time, I think you give the game away, right? Now, I think it's perfectly fine for you to be going, so that's all great. But then when you come in here, I think you need, like I think all of your instruments need to be in, you need to preserve the original arc of the melody because when you come in high you are giving away this beautiful huge peak that the you know that really has to climb over to get to the top right but when you just sort of just you know kind of carelessly happily rush all the way up to this f we have already we have basically spoiled the um the big peak here right you've sort of given it away and it's fine to go up to c here this is a different this is a different section of the music. It doesn't apply to this. But like, um, you know, suppose that everybody started an octave lower. You know, like especially the xylophone. All right? What if you did something like this? All right? And now you don't have that awkward drop, right? Right? Oh, and this right in here. 
So now, now look at how this line is working, right? Right, and like I can see, like instead of dropping here, okay, now check that out. Try that out at home and see how that works, right? So this way you preserve the integrity of the line and you don't, you know, you don't give away that big rush up to the top. And it just really seems like the curve that you that you hear in the piano part of Faya, right? But you know, but the original way, I just you know, we have that problem with like the drop, right? Um, that it, you know, it's it's not just that we're we're spoiling the F; it's also that we're just suddenly dropping, and I feel like the that the melody loses energy, right? Okay, so um, it, so the same thing here, right? Start lower. Right. So we don't we don't you know we don't have the D before. You know what I mean? It's it's it it's like we're sort of climbing back to where we started. So just you know, watch out for those drops and just like in just everybody dropping down a seventh too, it's sort of there's a sort of a sag to the energy. So you know, keep certain things up, let other things drop, is what I would say. So you could do something like this, right? Let the let the overtones give the illusion that the um, that the violins are continuing to support right in there, and then you just keep the integrity of the line, and then all of these other lines can jump up, right? And then that. And then I think that then, then you are preserving, and then like, and then of course here, drop this down. Right, see, and then I think the integrity of the line is preserved in that, with that kind of an approach. Now, as for the, you know, the, the scoring of it all, uh, I think it's, you know, it's pretty effective. I think, I, the, you know, it is really, really kind of driving, and and I like the choice of the instruments and the you know the overall color and stuff like that. But that's the other thing that you know that the little changes that I I proposed is also a way of balancing the octaves, right? Um, but you know, other than that concern, you know, nicely scored. Now, um. I like the way this ends. I like the way this leads forward. Um, the thing that I, I'm a little uncertain about this right in here is that you're taking this accompaniment part and you are kind of making it into the melody part, right? Because the the xylophone is just so powerful that you know whatever it touches turns into the melody, right? But what is the melody? It's E, E, E. Right, and then yeah, dun 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 dun, dun. right? Rather than dunk a dunk a dunk, right? That's not the melody, right? So, so watch out for throwing in an accompaniment part into an instrument that is just so melodically powerful, right? It just dominates and takes over, and and then like we lose the context of the melody of being, you know, it's like what Faya is doing is he's taking the context of this right in here and he's turning this into um into groups into like different rhythmic phrasing groups right and so e e e ba da 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 two and three and one two and three and one two and three and right so that's the that's the that's the rhythmic phrasing right in here right and i think that the way that you scored everything else is really really nice right um you know i i love the trumpet uh, doubling the um the xylophone from below and you know right in here you gave it the melody part and so you gave that same part to the xylophone right see that's the that is what happened but what if you just gave what if you had the um the xylophone part doubling the piccolo part at pitch right so you have that e e e and then and then the trumpet comes in to double it. Yeah, da, 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 dun, 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 right? I think that that would work perfectly.
All right, and then we are going to this. So, so that the big question that I have for you in like the way that this is scored, that is what happens afterwards. What's the next thing, right? How you know what are what are we what kind of passage are we transitioning into? Um, my two criteria here are maintaining a driving staccato and transitioning smoothly into the next passage. Well, we don't have an example of a next passage here. And here I think that like there's little um, there's little dashed diminuendos that I scored right in the little dashed hairpins are um, those can just be turned into standard hairpins. The dashed dynamics were put there to sort of show you what the pianist did and that is recommended as a possible, um, a possible way for the uh, the arranger or the orchestrator to approach the material, right? And you know, just one last little comment about balance. Um, it, it's great, like right in here, like you have forte in the horns to kind of balance them a little bit, but we still have the trumpets at fortissimo, right? And like the xylophone and piccolo at fortissimo and so on. So I think that you can really back everything off. I would say back off the the winds and the and the xylophone to forte and back off the brass to fortissimo. Excuse me, to mezzo forte. Sorry. And then and then crescendo into this, right? I think that, that that's a, a better approach. Or you can have everybody playing forte, but don't have the xylophone continue on fortissimo from this point on, because it just really it all becomes about the xylophone, and everybody can everybody else can just go home, really. All right. Um, so so yeah. So like, are you headed to like a really massive, you know, ba 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 ya da 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 dum, right? Is is that the intention going forward, right? But it, so if it's not, maybe you don't need piccolo on top. Uh, I really love the role of the of the hope of the horns in here and the the way they're tracked from below by the trombones. I think that's very very cool. And of course the flutes and oboes. There'll be a tendency right here, like that. You've got your second. Uh, excuse me. You've got your uh, first and second horns playing the same note as this as the oboes right in here and they're definitely going to get outplayed at the at least at the beginning by those horns right so maybe there's a way of kind of reinterpreting this what if the um what if the oboes were to play this the kind of the harmonized like right here this is a harmonized part what if the oboes were to take the role of the harmony above like right under the flutes right and then then you get a more balanced kind of a thing. So you have the um, Atu flutes and oboes playing the same thing as this an octave higher, right? And then like everybody kind of working their way down the same way. And then of course the the trombones at the bottom. I think that that would work a whole lot better. Anyway, um, yeah, so I mean that those were my thoughts on this. <laughs> Right, and you know, I'm picking it apart and stuff, and 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 being, you know, emphatic about certain things, and you know, reordering the the octaves in certain other parts. But it's just, you know, it is not an attempt to reshape you into my image of an orchestrator, but to try to take your conception and make it really, really shine. Right. So those those are my ideas on how to really bring out the best, the most in this orchestration and make it even better. And to, you know, if, if there's any of that that can help you build towards a better approach in orchestration as well. Right. I mean, this the same way as me looking at all of your ideas is helping me become a better orchestrator because I'm seeing all the different possibilities, all the things that I didn't even think of in my own in my own score. So, um, yeah, so if that is, if that is helpful, then I'm really happy about that. And, you know, I hope that I haven't been too, you know, sounded too bossy or, or inconsiderate about your great ideas here. So thank you so much, James. It was really a pleasure looking at your score. And now on to the next evaluation.
Okay, Robert, so you write wild here. Um, and, you know, there is a sense of wildness to the music. But I would actually say that in, in a lot of respects, this is one of the most balanced and, you know, of, of all of the entries, <laughs> you know, in terms of proportions between sections, in terms of the, you know, the functions of the instruments and their relationships to one another and everything else. So I see, you know, it may be wild, but I definitely see a sense of order here, right? Now, <clears throat> I like that the slower temper, the slower tempo here is it's very, very cool. I think it works really well with the um, like the the rhythm that you're setting up here. I, I think those rhythms are cool. <clears throat> so I'm wondering, is this um, <clears throat> is this Muse score or is it um, Dorico? And whichever one it is, <clears throat> is there a way of like actually just having the uh, percussion instrument change and everything being on the line, right? Because I'm just seeing over and over again certain scores where like the yeah like the castanets are are below the staff and the tambourines are above it and nothing is on the line right so or maybe cymbals or snare drum or something are on the line so or here we got we have alm glocken and then bass drum yeah so look you know i mean if, if you're gonna cheat a little bit and throw in four players four percussionists then that's fine I would say the bass drum player needs to play bass drum and the Alm Glocken player needs to play Alm Glocken, right? So I don't I don't think that, you know, they're going to be going doing dong 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 thump, right? I, I just, I, I wouldn't ask that. I would want my bass drum player to play just bass drum and I would want, you know, any kind of other percussion to be played. Yeah, so I, I think, yeah, just... Um, you know, give yourself four players if you need to give yourself four players in this in these evaluations. It's fine. Okay, <clears throat> so there aren't any huge issues here in terms of notation. I think you could just score a um, like a dotted half note, and then and then have an incomplete tie. Right? I think that that would be a more realistic kind of a thing. Just tsh, and just a little dying away in this bar, right? Yeah, you know, you know, a score like the the maximum before the decay starts to set in, right? Before the decay starts to set. Wow, that is that is really a um, you know um, a comment on modern life. You know, score the maximum before the decay starts to set in. Okay, but yeah, so score the maximum value um, of the symbol and then then have the incomplete tie past that value, right? So just a, just like what the what is the letting vibrate consequences, right? Okay. <clears throat> and otherwise I don't really see any big notation or instrumentation question. So so let's just jump straight into the evaluation criteria. So the whole question of, you know, pitch weight in the upper middle register of the piano transcribed onto the orchestra, that's not, that's not a problem. Um, the question of thematic material repeating often, possibly sounding repetitive if orchestrated the same exact way throughout. So, you know, I mean, I would say with this kind of scoring, it's not as much of an issue just because of the intense colors, right? And and you don't do it exactly the same way twice. You have this you have this little line right in here, right? Which and you have lower timpani, so there there is some you know there is some difference in there, right? I would actually want I would I would question why the uh, cellos here weren't. Um, in these two bars weren't doubled by the by either trombone or by be, even better by bassoons above right so that there would be a balance here so right here basically you're just you're just doubling the uh, double basses <clears throat> but not the cellos right so the cellos need a little bit of support as well is my estimation there so as to the you know as to the orchestration of it 
um, you, you have all these big, you know, what would sort of almost look like triple stops, right, for, for strings. These nice big three-part chords, nicely spread out. Uh, you know, almost a, almost as if they were on separate. You know, they're they're about the distance apart that you would finger pitches on a uh, in a triple stop. Yeah, so yeah, just nice big bright chords right in here. Now, you know, in <clears throat> this is a situation where I will not recommend that the brass be brought down one degree. And that is because the scoring of the winds and the strings are so powerfully in their own registers and, and more or less not stepped on by the other instruments that I think that it is fine the way that it is. I think you can score fortissimo for the horns and, and the heavy brass without worrying too much about it being stepped on. I would kind of like, I you know, I think that there's plenty of vertical space on this, on this screen. I think you could have easily put in um, third and fourth horns on their own staff. And then it would, this would be way clearer, right? Because, um, you know, you're being very careful to show me like what you want here, but like, I'm just guessing that what you mean is A2, 1 and 2, A2, 3 and 4 on the on the bottom, right? But you're not really giving me that. Like here, like I'm seeing 1 and 2 here, and then this goes up. And so you just assume, or I just assume, that this is A2 on each line. Of course, <clears throat> that's the wrong way to score it, right? The right way to score it, the first horn and the second horn should be playing octaves just as the third horn should be on top with the fourth horn playing octaves together. And that would be scored as octaves sharing the same stem, right, in both staves. It's better to do it that way with both the third and the fourth on the top line and the uh, second and the fourth on the bottom line. Not only do you have the high horns and the low horns in their positions, but each pair of horns is playing octaves together with each other and they're really, really good at playing the octaves. Now, of course, first and second are really great at playing unison together. That is no problem either. And there's no problem with the second playing up high here too, but it really is better to use your third player who's very, very, you know, whose job is to be a powerful high player um, to be playing up here with the first. And it's really better for the second player whose job is really to be playing the lower tones with a lot of force and, and fullness along with the fourth, right? So... It just, you know, maintaining that is, is much, much better. So I kind of don't know what's happening here, right? Who's playing this? Is this a single horn player? Is this two horn players? What's going on, right? So you're pretty careful about certain things, but not with the horns. And I think it would have worked better if you just had two staves here. But as far as, like, the orchestration, to get back to that... Um, you know, I, I like the stacked octaves and the strings here, doubled by the first clarinet and the uh, first and second flute. There really is no need for you to be having separate stems here. All you have to need, all you have to say is A2 at the beginning, right? And then just have a single line, a single voice going all the way through. And then you just have one take over here. And this is fine. This kind of scoring with the with the second voice coming in here and going to octaves, but you know you could just you could just have this once again just in in the first voice and then here the the intervals can share a stem right and then we know that it is two separate players and then back when you get to here you can just say a ah, ah, two again right and that's good enough for the copyist all of this can share a stem right it's all sharing the same rhythm and then here is where you'd want to separate things out. Okay, and you know I like I love these little flurries. This rium, you know rium pum 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 rium pum pum pum. It's kind of nice. Right. Now, <clears throat> watch out because it isn't necessarily yet da dun dun dun. That's over here. Da 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 da. Right, but that isn't what's going on here. It's yum dun 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 yet da dun 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 yet da dun dun pum 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 pum. Right, it isn't necessarily like. Kind of forcing this to be a five note pattern 
kind of messes up the emphasis of the downbeat in in this bar and in this bar I feel and also what's going on here what's this note supposed to be so you're throwing in a G there you can hear it in the mock-up and I can hear it in my inner ear just looking at this that the G is messing up the harmony right in here right because bum, 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 bum. It isn't an E third or an E or a G octave with an E stuck in the middle, right? Implying some kind of, you know, uh, implying some kind of like um, six three chord, right? Uh, it is a an E minor chord, and you really have to emphasize the root and the fifth, right? So maybe this was a a misspelling or a a miscalculation of the transposition or or just maybe a, a, a accidental right but yeah but I don't think the G works in here because yet yeah, it implies like a G major root right so the G and the B stuck together right so G in the bass and then B in the melody makes it seem as if it is like a, a G major six chord right so with the with the E being the six Okay, um, so that takes us to the these two parts, the sort of B1 and B2 parts. So <clears throat> this is very cool, the castanets coming in here. I like that a lot. And I like this push right here. You know, that's really cool. I don't know if you need to have A3 trumpets there. It might be enough to have B A2 or even just like the first trumpet. So our two concerns here are the melodic development, soaring quite high, you know, just really getting that arc perfect. And then the accompaniment figures covering a wide range of pitches and wind registers if you are dropping them into the winds. And here, you know, you, you, you take a really good approach right in here, and that is like to split it off between the first and the second player. I mean, there's no reason why one clarinetist couldn't comfortably play all of this or even a2 on the clarinets right and then you have that same kind of pattern more or less in the violas played in treble clef it's all good <clears throat> and then right in here um you, you do not need to have a tie here so the tie was in here because uh the uh the pianist's left hand was hitting the pinky finger here and the second finger there and then immediately hitting the pinky finger again so it was going da da dum da da dum bum bum right so it's like uh pinky second finger pinky thumb pointer right so so it's it's really it's that is why the tie is here because the fire wants to show you the rhythmic relationship between this note tied over and the pinky finger playing again right but since there is no other note relationship or rhythmic kind of thing, there's zero, like even here, you know, with these two separate players, there is zero need to underline the fact that this second, that the tie is going to land on the second beat of another instrument's note. So this can just turn into uh, quarter notes, right? So eighth, quarter, eighth on all of these. And then you, you, you know, you're telling the players, "Hey, go up bow here. Don't worry about that. That's the concertmaster's job to tell players when there's going to be a certain kind of a, of a bowing pattern, right? Unless you like want all down bows or all up bows or some kind of other bowing effect. There, that's really it's not necessary to point that out. The players will work it out. Okay, <clears throat> so." That leaves us with the the whole question of the um, of the melody, and I think that like you know the way that I had it in the template is the is the most readable option for beam grouping. So a beam grouping that is basically the entire bar is a much better strategy here, rather than having pairs of of beams. It's just you know the pairs of beams are just a distraction. It's better to have you know, you know, the beam groupings like four eighths, six eighths, all in a row, wherever that's possible. And it's just way easier on the eye. It's also a very clean kind of a look in the score. It helps, it keeps things organized. It's less distracting. All right, rant over. 
So our concern here is like the the treatment of the melody. So let's see your first and second, first oboe, first flute, playing octaves together. And then Atu, when both instruments plus piccolo. This is all good. You know, you could you could have always jumped. Um, you could have jumped back up to high A here in the flutes, right? Just like let these two notes play by their, you know, suggest by their overtones that the that the first flute is continuing on, uh, doubling the piccolo above, and then just jump back to high A. And given the the, um, the fundamental tone of the, the piccolo, more weight, right? Because here you're, you know, you are going all the way up to that high D in the violins, and it's perfectly possible. And just so long as you, you know, and, and also the high E here, just so long as you're willing to to um, go with that kind of slightly squeaky sound, right? You know, it's it's ameliorated by the doubling and the piccolo, so that's fine. Um, it just, you know, keep in mind, like, what, how, like, the string length at that point is just, you know, a few short inches, right? So it really doesn't, it's um, it's not the happiest sound, but it still works. Um, and you know, seeing as how you're going, you're you're taking off from here, and you're going with your trumpets. I think it's perfectly fine to send the violins all the way up there. And I'm really glad that you didn't use Ottava anywhere, which is one of my pet peeves, right? I mean, it's really not my pet peeve. It's just that I'm seeing it a lot, right? You know, like something that kind of sort of goes outside my experience of what what professionals want and prefer or whatever you know just kind of seeing it a lot in scores it seems like a pet peeve because I have to keep bringing it up that's that's the only reason why um, you know otherwise I really don't give a fig about it right <laughs> you know I don't I don't really care uh, so um, and now here we're going back to that same concern here you have pizzicato pluck 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 pluck, pluck, pluck. that's all fine um, why can't it be like you know? Just because it's arco here doesn't mean that the that your player can't immediately go to pizzicato. Like here, you're going pizzicato straight to arco, right? And it seems like you're giving a whole bar here so that the player can can um, can get ready to play pizzicato. That's not necessary. So they can just go directly to pizzicato, and that way you can have more weight on this line, which you need, right? Because look at all the stuff that's going on, all the competition, right? All right, so here you've got piccolo and flute, and they're kind of in a weak register, but it's all right because everything is dropping down in terms of the volume. I shouldn't say volume in terms of the dynamic. I'd say, like, have everybody at mezzo piano, right? Or, if anything, it's the pizzicato that should be louder than the, than the winds, right? Like, if you want to balance this, Right? It should be mezzo forte in the pizzicato and mezzo piano in the in the winds, right? That would balance things off. But then you've got your weaker flute right in here. So you know, you know that needs to that needs to compensate as well. So the I would say the best strategy is to have everybody play mezzo piano or mezzo forte. You know, you figure it out which one. You know, bah, 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 da, 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 da. this is really kind of nice. Like the the first flute coming over and sort of taking over for the piccolo part, and and so on. I don't, I'm not sure that you need to drop out here in the second flute. I think I'd, I'd keep the second flute doubling the pizzicato in here, just supporting it. And then yeah, bah, 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 This is really nice, just rushing up to that high screaming E. And and here I do approve of the of the strings dropping out just so that we can hear just hear the um the flute family really clearly and the relationship of that to the um to the horns and the bassoons however like you just really have to be aware if you are throwing horns in here you're basically obliterating your your flutes right like there's just no way that the flutes can survive even mezzo piano horns i, I mean mezzo piano what does that mean when you're going up to high B in this horn, right? If the horn were pitched an octave lower, so it was more or less doubling the the bassoon line as we see it here, the flutes would have something of a chance, but the horns would have to be scored like like piano, right? 
So yeah, so sending the horn way up here, I would say like it's actually like the the integrity of the line works better too if the horns start off an octave lower. And once again, this should be first and third, not first and second. If the ultimate goal is for the top of this line to reach up to, to high B, right? It really should be first and third playing together here. And then the second and fourth playing octaves below them. Right, so I would say back the back way the hell off in the horns right and then have them come up and then by the time you get to right around here like everybody pushing towards fortissimo that's fine i i don't see any reason why you need to play like the the uh, trombone part here needs to support the the trumpet part right you have three trumpet players you, you don't need any help from the trombones here but I, I would say that the um, first and second playing this line and then dropping to a triple octave is really, really nice. So, yeah, there's really no need to sail up to that high A here if you've got enough strength. If it weren't also for the fact that you have got two horns sitting on that as well. So, you know, what's the point of the trombone being there? Yeah, and so you have this really massive push going up to the top. That's great. And then starting the next phrase, bum, bum, bum. Yeah, and uh, dun, 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 I feel that like there needs to be a little bit more support on this, right? So you've got you've got piccolo in like kind of a fairly weak register here, right? It's like it'll pretty much just just get swallowed by the timbre of the violins without really contributing to it very much. The better choice would be actually first and second flute ah two. And you have like all of your instruments in the same octave, except for right here when you have like a, you're throwing an octave higher with a piccolo on top. So, um, yeah, I mean, is that what you want to do? do you, is, is it possible to change this into like, um, you know, rather than just having everything unison to turn it into an octave? Like maybe the seconds could be playing an octave lower, um, doubled by some other instrument, you know, trumpets or oboes or some other kind of thing, or clarinets? Is there a way of, of uh, having some kind of conversation between parts, you know? Um, you know, da-da-dum, winds, strings, trumpets, right? You know, is there some way of, of changing things around? Like, my issue with relentlessness in the evaluation criteria is more directed at the the kind of the concept that um, that everything is in the upper middle register but in this case there is a kind of a sense of relentlessness in just the mass all the way through right so is there some way of kind of shifting things around a little bit now here you're asking for a lot of different um, a lot of different pitches now a competent um, timpanist would be going like you know BBC, and they do it on the same. Uh, they would do it on the same drum, and then here they do the same thing G sharp, G sharp A, just like changing the tuning. And here they would use that same drum again and go A sharp, A sharp G, and just like changing it really quickly. But like it really is a lot of pitches. Is there any way you can economize on some of these? Right? Is the, can you use like here you are kind of implying. One, two, three, four pitches, maybe five, right? Or maybe this, these two could be played by the same drum. But yeah, I mean, it's just a lot of... I mean, you got all these bass brass instruments, you know. Could the, uh, could the timpani just be hammering away at one pitch? And then have the um, the some of the bass instruments going ba ba bum ba ba bum ba ba bum 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 right. And then here you could have the timpani uh, play those pitches and just have the have the timpani just play a single pitch right. So a a a and while well, everybody else is going G sharp G sharp A right. Then F, A sharp A sharp G you could go G G G right and it would like the the ear would fool. You know the ear of the the audience would be fooled that you know that the that the timpani was just playing the same pitch as the bass instruments around it. 
Uh, I like the way that you back off dynamically, right? And then you set this up for mezzo forte. Um, this is really almost like two parts on the xylophone. I mean, it's not that a good xylophone could not play this, but it's, you know, it really is kind of, yeah, this is, this is a lot to learn, right, at that, at that speed. Well, but you're going slower. Yeah, I guess it's not so much of a, yeah. Well, you know. All right, so here you want muted, a muted trumpets, and then you want open horns, and then you want high trombones. Yeah, I mean, it's all it's all possible. It's kind of fun actually. I like that, and the and the xylophone on top. I don't know. You might know, kind of hope. You know, I'm just kind of thinking like, what if you had xylophone and marimba, or you had. Uh, like xylophone on the bottom voice, and you had ch um, um, like glockenspiel on the top voice. Or if there's, is there some way of doing this so it isn't, you know? I'm just thinking. I think you just imagine hold the mallets in you know, hold the imaginary mallets in your hand and play this. You know, bum 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 bum. It's just really, it's a you know. I mean, it would be better to have the top line with a xylophone and have some kind of very strong instrument tracking from below, right? Whether it's like piccolo or, I mean, something, right? Or pizzicato or, you know, I just feel like there's, that there's a, a more convenient way to score this. Now watch all the xylophonists in the audience will say, well, I could play that standing on my head. But, you know, I just like, you don't know that you're going to be able to get those guys who are commenting on how easy it is in the orchestra that this is going to eventually be played by, right? If it is. So anyway, just think about that, all right? All right, so I should stop yapping about this and just say that, like, you know, despite all of my caveats and suggestions and feedback and stuff. I still think it's a really great score and really fun. Um, and I thought the mock-up worked really, really well, right? And and it was just really, you know, just really had strong bones, right? It just had a, you know, it's a big boned piece. So really nicely done. So thank you so much, Robert. And now on to the last evaluation for this set of entries for the website subscribers. What an exciting score, Stephanie, and what a terrific way to finish off this collection of, uh, you know, multicolored, multivarious is a kind of an old-fashioned word, an old-fashioned way of referring to something like this. This multivarious collection of different entries, just from so many different outlooks and um, levels of experience and and you know and motives right the like the the different motives of the different orchestrators so um i think that i can help you in a lot of different ways here and i think probably the 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 biggest things that you know the biggest concerns looking at this are um proportions and instrumental balance right and you're already thinking of some of those issues but there are definitely places where some of your conceptions feel a little weaker than they could be, right? And, there, and so, like, let's see if there's some way of, of making things a little bit more strong, right? And, and also, I, th I think we should start off with just discussing, like, how, uh, how efficacious is the harp? Now, the thing, that honest truth here is that you're, you know, you, you start on the downbeat with this massive tutti, like wham, all of these instruments playing at once. Pow! You really are hitting the downbeat very solidly with all the instruments. Okay, great. Uh, and that would seem to suggest that the harp 
would be sort of useless because it cannot compete with what's going on here at all, right? So that you can't hear the harp on this downbeat and, you know, there's kind of no sense in even scoring it. However, going forwards, uh, there is more room for harp because they're, you know, you're taking out all of the, you know, a lot of the instruments that absorb its timbral quality, except for the one thing, and that is that you have pizzicato strings. Pizzicato strings are covering the same pitches as the harp here, and the sound of these instruments, we have uh, 16 uh, first violinists, and we have 14 second violinists, and they're each plucking all those different strings, and the harpist is only plucking one string per pitch, right? So they have absolutely no chance of coming through here. So, so I would say that like, and here, you know, you have, once again, 16 first violinists are all plucking this B, right? And the, the harp just doesn't have any chance with this one single string on a B. So, uh, and then like getting right into here, we have this, you know, bum ba da da bum ba da da and you know, once again, the sound of the, like the doubling at the exact same pitches, the harp doesn't really have much of a chance. Now, if the harp were to be an octave higher, maybe you could hear it, right? So if, if all of this were, were jumping up an octave, then you wouldn't have to worry so much about these uh, pizzicato tones playing the same exact pitches, and there might be a chance. You could just put an ottava line over all of this right hand scoring in here and, and see how you go, and then change this into a, a treble clef and um, transpose this up an octave, right? See if that works. Throw in some big roll marks, right? Roll marks on all of these chords. So that there's room, 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 right, da, 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 room, 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 da, da, da. Right. And I think that that would work just because there's more space, because you don't have so much going on. Now, let's say that, um, let's say that you did have a very, very full presence of brass and timpani throughout all four of these bars. Then I would say the harp has no chance. It doesn't matter what octave you play it in. But just because there is some space right in here, I think by jumping up the octave in the harp and throwing in some roll marks, I think that it has a chance of being heard. And the same thing on the, like these high Bs could be played an octave higher. The This accompaniment pattern in here could be played an octave higher. And I think that it might come through really nicely, right? Um, but keep the fortissimo uh, dynamic here. And then right in here, uh, in order to optimize these harp notes right in here, that bring down the volume of everything else. And that will also play a role in how to balance this very underpowered flute solo right in here. I really like the way that you're, you are being careful to tell me like first player, ah two, um, things like that. Uh, pizzicato, sempre non divisi. Those are all, that's like musical punctuation. One last little thing that I'll comment on uh, in terms of just notation issues is right here. I think that what you need here is not uh, a double beam tremolo, but just a single beam tremolo, right? Because I, I think what you want here are 16th notes. You want right? I don't think you want which, by the way, is very, very hard to play at this speed, right? You're trying to get different articulated notes, or articulated. You're trying to get different um, randomly uh, tremoloed notes, like the um, indeterminate or um, unmeasured tremolo. Uh, and, and it's, you know, at that speed, you are really going, yeah, da, 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 da. So if you're going to, if that is what's going to happen anyways, then it should be scored like this. And then it's just more emphatic and stronger as you get towards the bottom end right in here. <clears throat> All right, now let's talk about the website entrant evaluation criteria. Yes, I'm going to drag that list out again. So the first concern is whether or not the uh, piano music is transcribed exactly in terms of pitch onto the orchestra, which would make everything sound too much in the upper middle register. 
that is not a concern. You have very beautifully uh, scored across the full scope of the orchestra. That's very nice. <clears throat> then the next concern is thematic material repeats often in the piano score, possibly sounding repetitive if orchestrated the same exact way throughout. Well, you know, that is a concern right in here. Right? You, you are scoring these two bars the same as these two bars, the same as these two bars, the same as these two bars. So you might think to yourself, well, so what? You know, why is that a problem, Thomas? And what I will say to you, Stephanie, is that we don't know where these, <laughs> where these entries will go. What if you were to show this to, let's say that, you, you know, you, you end up having a friend and the friend ends up conducting a community orchestra and they hear about you being in this, uh, in this challenge and they want to take a look at your score and they look at it and they say, well, this is great. This is genius, Stephanie. This is so beautiful. I want you to, I want you to orchestrate the entire thing and then we'll perform it with our orchestra. And so you go back home and you, you score out the entire thing and you give it to the conductor and the conductor, uh, performs it and it's a hit and she, you know, the YouTube video, is shared and other conductors are interested and suddenly your orchestration of this piece becomes a worldwide phenomenon. It could happen. But if it does happen, are you going to want these two groups of four bars to be exactly the same? Right? Imagine this piece is being performed hundreds of times, right? Will you be satisfied sitting down in the audience and listening to this and, you know, and just like maybe every single time you hear it, you're thinking more and more like, oh, why didn't I do something different than these four bars came around again? So my suggestion is, is that, you know, think about, is there any way that you could progress the texture, right? So I, I'm using that over and over. I'm sorry if people are sick of me saying it. <clears throat> but is there, is there some way that the... Um, you know, the things could get bigger or could change a little bit. Like, I'm not saying a lot. Not Don't make these two sections completely different from each other, but make this section build on what's in here more, right? And you could do that just by making this a little less, right? Just like dr pulling back on some of the things that are in here and then making them more emphatic here, right? That That's a possible way of approaching it. So just think about that as a possibility. Now, just looking at the way that it is scored, uh, just that the orchestration itself, um, the you know there are some pitfalls in the in the uh, grace notes that you didn't fall for. That's really great. You you know you did a fabulous job of interpreting them. You're keeping the piccolo in its stronger register. It's just very nicely scored. I feel yeah, and I, I like the way that these chords are interpreted. I like the support from the pizzicato, just excellent. And the, you know, once again, if you if you move the harp up into uh, you know one octave higher and have lots of rolls, I think that it's very very audible. And I really love these big tutti chords, pow, at the downbeat. You know, I think it's really really great. Okay. You know, what if the what if the change that you had between these two parts was. Um, you just took away all of the percussion and lower brass. What if you just went and then here, boom, dun 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 boom, dun 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 dun. I would call that a progression of the texture. Okay, so now moving on to the B section. So this is section B1 and B2, right? So uh, in our B sections, we have to think about the melodic development getting very high, and we have to think about the the accompaniment figures covering a very wide range, right? And here you have solved the problem by having the pizzicato spread across two different string instruments, right? the two the violins. Here you're having the clarinets. Um, and it, there's no need, you know, there's no reason why your first clarinet couldn't jump up and play a high C sharp here, high written C sharp. <clears throat> I'm sure it would be fine. 
And then right in here, this ya da 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 you know, what happened to the clarinet doubling? You could still double that on clarinet. I think that you need the weight, right? I think another thing that you could put into these sections just in general is a is a dynamic um, a dynamic contrast. Right? Here you have fortissimo. And now how about how about forte or mezzo forte? Do you see what I mean? Like you like why does it always have to scream out throughout these entire 16 bars? And then yeah da 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 and how about dropping down? See now here reduce the volume in both parts. You can hear the all of a sudden you can hear the harp, hopefully an octave higher. Jump down to forte or even mezzo forte, right? And then the horn right in here could play piano because it's it's sort of it is even as soft as this is compared to fortissimo here it is absorbing some of the sound of the harp and and the flute right so what i would recommend both times right in here have the piccolo jump down and and um double the flute at pitch Right. And, and, and like I realize right here, you, you've really worked this out. This is sort of like solo flute going trading off to solo piccolo. But I feel that with this much activity in the accompaniment, I think you should have this atu soli plus piccolo. Right. And then you can have the flutes drop down an octave here and then rejoin. Right. So that's one way of making sure that this this uh melody doesn't get overwhelmed right and then but just right in here like you can really hear with the the kind of the snarling uh horns and even just this mezzo piano accents right in here which is really kind of let's face it that's mezzo forte right mezzo piano with accents on it is mezzo forte okay um you know and, and also just like the violas reaching up and everything else you can hear it on the mock-up this this is just very weak compared to everything else that's going on. So once again, I would say A2 on the flutes and um, and have the piccolo double at pitch. And then everything else works really, really well, I'd say, going in there. <clears throat> now, right here, we get to this um, section right here. Uh, da, 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 um, So are you sure that you want no articulation marks here? In the piano score, it's all accents, and I feel that that is really needed. And then here you have a dum in the oboe part, right? So I think the slurred parts, especially the slurred horns, are going to give this a sort of a slightly... Um, it's, um, <clears throat> like a, a slightly it's it, it's like we're we're, we're sort of uh, damping down on the energy right <clears throat> the other problem here is that the uh is that the first violins are doubling the oboes in the harmony part on their highest pitch right and and the flute up here which has the melody doesn't have any doubling from the strings right in fact the strings are not doubling the melody at all except for in the violas which are kind of the weakest of the upper strings so you know is there some way of maybe doing divisi here or doing some other kind of thing or just even having you know leaving the harmony parts to the uh to the winds and the horns and having the uh having the violins play the melody along with say first flute second oboe, um, and so on. So this is a little strange. So you've got, yeah, so that this is, this is hitting, so like the C's, those repeated C's are, you know, they're going to have more force than the melody. 
right? So we, we're really not getting those. So like you've got these three sounding C's are all sitting on the second trumpet part and balancing against that much weight, right? Especially being high horn parts, which are very loud. We have just a single trumpet and uh, second clarinet, excuse me, first clarinet, second oboe, right? And, and no strings. So yeah, so it's just the balance needs to be reworked in here. I would say leave this, um, leave this kind of internal harmonic, harmonizing to the winds and the strings, have the, have the violins really hit that E hard and throw back the, you know, put the accents back, maybe take out the slur. Just really have that E, 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 because that is the melody, right? It really has to be much more emphatic. And then, dun, 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 dun. I really love the way you trade off here. Um, you know, flute plus oboes, yeah, dun, 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 dun. Oboe plus clarinet octaves, dun, 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 dun. And then here you have the horn plus the clarinets. And that that's a, I would say go to A2 clarinet. Or no, that's not, that's not good. Because you got the phase sound. Okay, so mark this forte in the horn, right? Just to get a more of a balance or even mezzo forte. So mezzo forte in the horn, f keep your fortissimo strong here in the clarinet, and then you'll get a balance. And then, yep, up, 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 Now here you're thinking about the balance, right? But the brass are still very, very powerful, especially if you're gonna go all the way up to G again in your, in your horns, right? That just like, that is so bright. And going up to G in your C trumpet as well. It's C, of course, sounding C. And this is, of course, uh, just sounding G. And then you have very high trombones as well. So going high with all of these instruments means that it really is effectively is, is almost forte, right? So it is, it is essentially going to be more powerful, more penetrating than the strings right in here. So the correct dynamic here is piano, not mezzo piano. So start off piano, and it'll be hard to keep stay at piano going up to the G, but whatever, the players can control it. You know, they'll, they'll have their idea of what piano means on those high pitches. And then all the crescendo should be the same. Uh, I see what you're doing here. Like you're having the second part take over. Hmm. You know, there's there's no reason why one player couldn't play the entire line, just as long as they have a chance to take a breath afterwards. So I don't think you need to to split up the this into first and second like this. Yeah, and then for if you're going forte, molto, marcato, crescendo, what's the dynamic here? It's fortissimo, right? What if you were to trade off on the downbeat here? Wait a little bit longer, right? So you have your violas last until here, and then you have the cello take over here. You have your first violins last until here, and then you have your second violins or violas take over there. There kind of is no need for the second violins to trade off at all, right? They can play all of these pitches. And the violas can play all of these pitches too. So what if you just had your violas continue on and your um, your violins continue on and you just brought in the second violins and the uh, cellos just as more pitch weight, right? So you got da 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 thicker, ba 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 You know, I think that would work perfectly. Okay, so yeah, and that would help to balance against the brass in here. So you push these even up to mezzo forte, right? I would say... Piano, crescendo to mezzo forte, really mark it. And then you don't need for this to be dashed. This is a, this dash diminuendo is because that's what the pianists do, right? So like the, <clears throat> the dash dynamics in the, uh, in the, the template score are put in there because as a suggestion of what you can put in as a real dynamic because that's what pianists do when they interpret this piece. So to get it more realistic, right? Um, 
that is that is a strategy that you can take. So so get rid of the dash, put in a real um, a real diminuendo. So I know that like a few minutes ago I was I was saying you know well what if you know, what if your piece became you know the standard right and and everybody performed it and you know I was that was using that as a hypothetical as to why possibly these two sections should be different. But you know what if your piece was did become the standard? What if any one of these pieces that we heard in this, or that we looked at in this collection, had a chance of doing that if they were scored all the way through? You know, if the if the orchestrators worked on them and 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 you know kept uh, it just you know didn't didn't weren't satisfied with the first effort and just kept uh, perfecting and honing their craft and everything else. I mean, it it would be great if if maybe not the piece itself, but what you learned from your own scoring, uh, whether it has anything to do with my evaluation or not. But what you learned through the process of, of scoring your piece, if that were to build to something that did become more, you know, something that was performed a lot in your in your own repertoire or across the world, or or even just in your your hometown, right? Um, I mean, I, I have a piece that has been performed, uh, it's like a dozen times now, maybe 15 times here in New Zealand. Um, that is Tane and the Kiwi. And like, I was totally not expecting it to be, be performed more than a couple of times. And it's become kind of a standard here in New Zealand for like kind of a, I mean, it's a, Admittedly, it's kind of a family concert sort of a piece, um, but it you know it's one of those things that that kind of has higher aspirations, sort of like Peter and the Wolf, right? It's it's like something that could be taken as concert music or it could be a fun kid story with music. So um, you know, there's something about that feeling of you know the piece being performed again and again. Um, you know, like the piece starts to have its own identity and culture and and presence and so on and so forth. So. So, you know, I, I would just like hope that that through these evaluations, people could like, you know, think about, you know, the proportion of the work possibly having some kind of permanence or, you know, having some kind of logic to it that it just really feels like it is absolutely meant to happen. And I hear that in a lot of like the proportions, like the, I think that that's the key why I keep coming back to the word proportions. Like, for instance, here, Stephanie, you have some really great proportions and then you have some others that I kind of want to fix and so on. But like the way that one idea follows the other, kind of feeling inevitable and then, you know, sort of powerfully moving on to the next idea, right? That is the kind of thing that I think makes a piece immortal or, or, or you know, at least ends up having it played a lot within a particular generation with a particular outlook, right? Um, like sort of like the Warsaw Concerto, right? So that was performed a huge amount when I was a child. So much so that, like, you know, when it came time for my youth orchestra to, to perform it, I was just like, you know, I was like, oh, we're going to play this. Wow. I, I had no idea that our orchestra was this good, you know. And then we played it all and it was sort of like, oh, um, yeah, OK. I, you know, it's not as hard as it sounds. Um, but but, you know, that that piece kind of has not really survived past that generation. I mean, it's still kind of trotted out as a curiosity today. But you know, back then it was taken really, really seriously. Uh, so, you know, so just like thinking about the sense of in inevitability, whether or not it's just for one generation, or just for your own lifetime, or just a period of your career, or whatever, I think that that really, you know, that can relate to any style of music, any approach, uh, and so on. So anyways, those are my little thoughts coming to the end of this video. So I want to thank you, Stephanie, for this excellent score. And I remember that this was kind of like a last minute entry, <laughs> right? And it was it was like I um, you didn't miss the deadline, but your your entry had kind of gotten lost in in I think in my um, uh, in my uh, spam fol folder or something like that. And it was really I, I was really happy that you. Uh, call that to my attention so that I was able to bring this into the the you know this these last couple of rounds or last three rounds of uh, website 
subscriber evaluations because it's a very cool score. So thanks everybody. Um, I really enjoyed looking at your pieces. You know, I mean, you all have something valid to say artistically, and I'm, I'm so happy to be witnessing it here in these entries. And I hope that you will all find the time to participate in next year's orchestration challenge, because it'd be really interesting to see what each of you has to say or the approach that each of you have to that material, which is so different from this. I'll see you all soon with more evaluations, uh, individual and these collections, very, very soon.